Oh, you thought we forgot about the Pittsburgh Pirates? Are you crazy? Obviously, we didn't forget about them. Gorgeous, gorgeous day in God's country. It's Prusinski and Rowdy Telez right from the jump here at Pirates Camp. Kratz and me in our little spots. AJ, you want to bring in our very, very special guest to lead off the day at Pirates Camp? Superstar As Kratz said, do you mean special guest or do you mean special guest? Both. Hey, we're on air. Which, which one? Because he's our special guest. Is that wind but real right now? That wind is for real yeah. right now. Wow. And this is the best spot we could find where it Can was. Can you tell by my hair? <laughs> yeah, blowing. dude. <laughs> it's blowing. Yeah. The only thing I'm mad at Rowdy for right now is that he did not have his Pilates instructor here. I needed to get a good workout in while I was waiting for the clubhouse well, to open. I broke the machine because it was made in like 86. So we had to get a new one. So that's going to Pittsburgh. But by the looks of it, uh, of AJ, he wasn't doing Pilates. So I'm not too worried. <laughs> Are you guys going to do say, a demonstration for us, AJ? I, I, I will say this. Yeah, I, I'm not flexible at all, so I will not. Say, I do not claim that. But I will say this. We have our first ever Triple X shirt wearer sitting right here. Dan, bull, dude, it's not true. <laughs> Someone asked if this was my dad, and I said, no, I dad would never be that much of a loser. But uh, it's good <laughs> to be on the show. I'm happy to be here. I need to be more positive. And um, so... I guess okay, AJ then was good, AJ was a good player, and I'll let him know. I guess there you go. Well, here for more positivity, sell me on the Pirates. What do you got? Like, what's the scouting report? Who's good? You know, what's this team going to look like at the beginning of the year? Uh, we're going to be pretty good. Um, you know, we're just a young team, uh, so that's going to be uh, something that I think a lot of people overlook. But you no, know, we're good. We can swing it. We got a lot of a lot of good hitters. Um, you know, from top to bottom, I think the length of our lineup is going to be something that people overlook also. And then uh. Just say young. Our bullpen's unbelievable, by the way. But just say young staff um, all together. But you have sprinkled in some veteran guys, and um, it's really shown uh, in our camp how much they've helped uh, everybody. Where are you hitting in the lineup? Eight? Ten. Extra hitter. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you want to hit? Um, wherever they have me. I think I'm hitting six. I've hit six, fifth or six most of camp. Where are you hitting today? Fifth or sixth. Have you seen the lineup today? Um, I know I'm DHing today. But you don't know where? Yeah, no. It's the first time I've DHed this camp. So, although Stevie Cohen, uh, the Rawlings guy from you guys that have used Rawlings, said that they're going to make a gold glove for DH and I'm the top candidate. So. <laughs> but it's been good. Hey, the last day, the last day of spring training, you guys going to do anything cool? Like, like nobody, hey, everybody swing at the first pitch? Hold on, Kratz, do you know who this is? Because I don't know who this is. Oh, Bradley Haddad. Rowdy, Rowdy, his name is Bradley Haddad, okay? Bradley Haddad. One of the coaches that you're new. That you're well, I actually play, I played against him, so I do know who that is. But nice try. I'm not a bad teammate like AJ, and I did <laughs> learn everybody's name. But hey. – Back to your question, I think we're all going to use the same bat. We should. Those were the days, you know, like game with last day, swinging at the first pitch. Games were like 53 minutes. It was – those were the those were the days. But now everybody cares and stuff, and it's crazy. You should – you're this is your this is your one chance. Like, you got, a, you got a guaranteed deal. You should head this up and be like, look, guys, we're going one bat the whole day. I don't care whose it is. You get the smallest one, the biggest one. It doesn't matter. Everybody go out there and swing it. Because the, yeah. the coaches will be pissed if you swing it all first pitches and their pitchers like out there in the eighth with 32 pitches. That wouldn't work out well. I think from what I've heard, I think they have an awesome in front of them. So um, I think he would appreciate that. But uh, AJ was trying to tell Shelt that um, I had a lot to prove uh, to make this team. So, But I'm glad you said guaranteed deal uh, just to let him know. That some of us are on contract. Wait, is it really guaranteed, or is it like uh, the guy on San Francisco that was only forty-five? JD days? Davis. JD, JD Davis, Davis guaranteed. By the way, JD was my high school teammate. Yeah, he's from the Bay Area. Yeah, he is also from uh, Elk Grove, <laughs> which is two hours and twenty minutes from the Bay Area. Thank, big shout out, big shout out to our intern for that one. Uh, yeah, that that kind of sucked. That kind, that really sucked. 
Yeah. And does that change? I don't know. <laughs> like, we just put in the, put that in. Like, it's in there. That I mean, you're going to make $7 million to, I got to find a new team. That's just, that's, that's not what you want. Um, but, you know, he's, he's a good player, so I think he'll fit in good over there. Stayed in the Bay Area, because, you know, obviously that's Sacramento and San Francisco are side by side. Francisco and Oakland. We kind of fit in the middle. We're like on the bridge. But uh, yeah, so he'll, he'll be fine. He can, he'll do good. You didn't. So you you know what? It's funny you say that you didn't know that you could make that. That's That's been a rule forever. But no one's, no team has ever done it. No team's ever been like, we're tendering you a contract and we, oh, we lost our one arbitration against you. By the way, we're screwing you now. By releasing you and only we only have to pay you what 45 yeah. days of it like they just don't do that because normally if you get to arbitration you're a good player and if you go to trial they want you so it's just it was a fluke but it was still bullshit it is i i 100 agree i think uh make a good point i will never admit that you make good points but that one was a good point <laughs> like if you do take your team to arbitration and win like there should be something where it's like hey man we may have told you a lot of things that we didn't like about you but we like you enough to offer you that contract, so I think that should be guaranteed. But, you know, that's why I stand at first base and I don't make rules. Rowdy, have you gotten to hang out with uh, Andrew McCutcheon? Yeah, he, uh, you know, we've been playing together for a year. Uh, he's an awesome dude. But, um, yeah, he, he's been great on camp. He uh, recently had a, his fourth child, uh, a daughter, so uh, AJ was – Saying that he didn't get the to leave camp like a like a, uh, a coach isn't here today, you know he got to take care of his family. And so AJ said that he could never do that. You know, the game's changed a little bit. He said that he had to be good to do that. So um, coach is different. You know he's got the MVP and the blue gloves. And he actually has silver sluggers. He didn't buy it on Etsy or whatever it was. Uh, but you know he gets to do as he pleases. He's on the Mount Rushmore of a team. Um, so, obviously, uh, you know, everybody's played against Kutch, watched him play, um, been around for a long time. So. Did he know your name when you walked up to him first time? Yeah, he did, believe it or not. AJ was scaring kids in camp. Okay, Marco said that AJ was a nice guy to him when they were on the Cardinals when Marco was a rookie, and I that crushed my soul. <laughs> <laughs> that one really hurt because I didn't want it to be true and it was so again i like i said i got to be nice at some point people are saying like hey you need to be better better guy um so speak up oh use your use your inside outside voice yeah i i don't like to talk very much i'm a pretty quiet guy so i uh I'll speak a little for you guys uh, but yeah that, that it's tough to hear that that he was a uh a good guy that one hurt it really did and i I still don't believe it. He paid him, for sure. He's got heavy pockets, deep pockets. He'll let you know that he's rich. Hey, so, Rowdy, I got a question for you, and this is more Rowdy. So, Rowdy's wearing 44. I told him he needs to wear a single digit because it'll make him look thinner. But he went 44, and I said they had to. He's the only guy in camp that they use the old letters on because the little new ones they put on don't fit so no one can see them. So they went back just for Rowdy to put the big ones on and they had to go jumbo size fours. Do you agree or disagree? No, I say, I say, especially with his thin legs, he should definitely go with 44. It makes him look like, like besides, besides the hair, I'm going Giancarlo Stanton comp right now. Like wide, wide shoulders down to svelte, hips down to just massive calves. Hourglass. Fish. Coke bottle. I prefer yeah. I'm a Coke upside, bottle. Upside down Coke, Coke bottle. bottle. <laughs> hey, you you try with a SpongeBob? Crap, SpongeBob? Okay. Listen here, Patrick. Why? I don't need you comping me to SpongeBob. <laughs> You're over here. I say young Carlos Stanton. I like Thank 44. I, I do. It's a good number. I would have gone 45. Did you choose 44? Yeah, I did. I did. I that was my number. I would have gone 45. Kid. But Why 45? Jordan, Jordan came back. Oh. 
All right, we're going to let you guys go because it sounds like the movie Twister. Kids, Google it. So, Rowdy, good to see you. We're going to talk to you when you guys are inside. Um, please, somebody put your lights down on that tent behind you. I am very concerned. Is it really windy out there? Dude, it's, yeah. it's windy. Bad. Yeah. It's windy. And we're just in Dude, the I, open. I feel it. AJ can probably hit one out of the infield today. It's pretty crazy. Oof. It's gonna be Oof. Good <laughs> I feel it. Good to see you, Rowdy. We'll talk to you during the year, all right? Oh, yeah. Thanks, sure. dude. Thanks, Appreciate Sam. you. AJ, we'll try and work on some things. Woo! It is cray cray. We hear you, people oh. that are listening with us right now. It is cray. At least I feel better, right? Like, it's the, it's the surroundings. It's Mother Nature. You know? It's not like uh, some insert minor league team Wi-Fi or something like that. It's just insert going Rangers through it out there. from the other day. The Rangers <laughs> Wi-Fi with, with Lorenzen. Yeah. Well, when you're in the tunnel, things are going to happen. So yeah. um, ready to have some fun. We, we had a few bits of news here and there over the weekend. Let's charge the mound and start with spreading rumors. <laughs> wow. Was that you? Some new tricks, yeah. There are many new tricks to be unveiled over the next week and announcements. We have another new teammate that will be joining us later this week. Stay tuned. It will not be Jordan Montgomery. He will sign with the Major League Ball Club. Mm. I'll say this week. Wow, you were right. You've been right when people are signing. Yes, and that is a hunch. I'm not making 90 phone calls. I make a few, but not many. But Jim Bowden does. So he said, according to a source, Jordan Montgomery has two teams offering him long-term contracts and his market has finally hit and it's getting competitive. Four playoff teams, Arizona, Philadelphia, Yanks, Astros, lost significant starters to injuries. Red Sox, Yankees still involved to some degree. And then he also followed that up by saying, don't sleep on the Diamondbacks on Jay Montgomery or... Remember, the Orioles ownership change is official this week. Okay, I've thrown a lot of teams out there. Who, when, for how much? First, I'd like to say, man, I would love to see Monty because I really like Monty. I like Blake Snell too, but I really like Monty. I would love to see him get the biggest contract of that four that everyone's like, well, it's time for him to sign just a little – Little little tiddlywinks deal. But anyway, his market's different. Who do I think it's going to be? I, I was trying to think who the, who the Diamondbacks lost to injury. Was it, uh, was it the lat strain? Um, Eduardo Rodriguez got a, has a lat strain. Is that what it is? Yes. Yes. I, man, I, I have a hard time believing they're not number one in the clubhouse right now. Because of the fact that they had that's talking about a long-term deal. If it was like a one year kind of, you know, what everybody's been getting recently, what Chapman got, what Snell got, to me, if it's money and a long year, long-term deal, like a five to six year piece, the Diamondbacks are right in that window. They are signing their guys for that extension time. They have Carroll. They have Erod, which he's going to be back. It's a latch strain. It's not, you know, we're not talking about Tommy John where he's out the whole year. And they saw front and center what he did in the playoffs. And they know how hard it is to get there. And they know what kind of value that is. And I think the Orioles, too soon. Too soon. I, I, Ooh, I, like, I would love to see it. I would love I, I to like see it. it. Their I payroll like is it. pennies. Their payroll is pennies. It is pennies, but do you want as a is that is that your mark that you want to make as new ownership? You want to go and get Jordan Montgomery, or do you want to say we are going to lock up one of our guys this year and we're going to make an absolute push at Corbin Burns? Both. All. Both or all three? This is their winning window. This is their so time. You want to, to get money? You want to lock up Burns and you want to lock up one of your young guys? No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to hold off on that last part. Corbin Burns is going to free agency, and there are teams that will probably outspend Baltimore. I'm not going to worry about that situation for now. But the so first have to go few goals sound like they can be accomplished. Monty, yes, and he will cost 
probably half the price, if not less than half at this point, versus yeah. Corbin. And you start to throw offers out there for the young guys. Also remember the season starting in like two days. And some players do not want to go over the extension situations during the season. This is the prime opportunity of a lifetime for a new ownership group to step in, look around, and say there is still one of the top players available on the market for our ball club. He would be perfect. He eats up innings. He's a playoff starter. He helped the Rangers win a World Series. I think pitching is always the problem with the World Series hangover. So let's bring in some fresh arms. We don't know the Bradish situation long term for this season and beyond, right? We'll see if he comes back and he's good to go. Either way, they can use Amante in the rotation. And if money is the only problem, Baltimore is well below the luxury salary tax, whatever salary cap you want to call it. They've got room to spend. And with a new group, it would be awesome. I know it's probably a pipe dream, Kratz, but it is possible. Patty, pipe dreams or not, let's get to the manager of the Pirates. He is really on a time crunch. Okay, cool. let's do it. Coastal. Derek Shelton with us right now, manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Can you hear them? Yeah. Hey, Derek, how are you? What's going on, guys? How are you? How's things? It's good to see you. How's camp? You're almost done. We're almost done. We're uh, we're about four hours away from being done, so it's a uh, great time to be in camp or to be out of camp. Actually, how you look at it. today sucks, though, for you guys, doesn't it? Why is that? Well, because you have to tell certain people, like, hey, by the way. Uh... No, yesterday sucked. Oh, that was Yes-ter- yesterday. Yesterday was the, the day, so everybody's either really happy or, or disappointed today. So there's that's the great part of the job, and it's also the challenging part of the job. Would you be mad today? If Rowdy, if you just had Rowdy on, told everybody they have to use one bat and they have to swing at the first pitch, and you went like 27 up, 27 down on 27 pitches. Well, we almost did that yesterday. Stroman came out and threw a ton of strikes. We had a five-pitch inning and a three-pitch inning. You had a three-pitch inning in a big league game? In a big league game with balls that, I mean, we're all striking. Was there like a double play? No. Three-pitch, three-ground balls, Stroman pitching for the Who's your hitting coach? Yeah, it, no, it were all we just hit the ball on the ground. That's why I'm not a hitting coach. <laughs> but anymore. no, but didn't you t- didn't you yell it like, "Hey, take one!" Yeah, we we should have on the third one there. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the reaper? Who's the reaper? If yesterday was the ultimate cut down day, actually, first of all, I got to say you look incredibly handsome as a manager. The V neck is unbelievable, and you don't need to be a hitting coach anymore. But who is the reaper? Who's the well, reaper? I want, that, cut I want that to be the cut. I want that to be the cut on the show that. Uh, that the, you like the V-neck and and uh, I'm assuming it'll make it. the beard. Yeah, it'll make uh, it. So on the position player side, it's Donnie Kelly. So Kratzy, did you ever play with Donnie Kelly? Oh, uh, you guys I played a long time. Oh yeah, yeah. So DK is on the uh, position player side, and on the uh, pitching side, it's Jeremy Blyce, who's our uh, one of our pitching guys, our assistant director of pitching. He's the guy that's going to get in people. But Donnie's the main one, and that's. I mean, that's a job that sucks. I had to do that in Minnesota. You got to go get guys. It's not a fun job. When you tap a guy on the shoulder, they're just like, Fuck. Yeah, and yesterday was the day where, like, everybody was just sitting around waiting. So there was a group of the guys that were, you know, getting really good news and guys that were getting some disappointing news were kind of all together. So, you know, that sucks when that happens. All right, so give us give us some positives about the Pittsburgh Pirates. Jared Jones made the team, right? Yeah. Is he going to be a starter? He's going to be a starter. Okay, any other surprises in camp that have stood out? And, and the future looks bright in Pittsburgh. O'Neal's, O'Neal Cruz is back, right? If Ryan's locked up. You locked up Keller. You have Reynolds. You have you have uh, Henry, da- uh, right. Henry Davis. Right. Davis, yeah. Is the, you know, the catcher. Yeah, I, one. I think I think that, that – let's start with Henry. You know, last year he didn't catch – no, he did. Um, he, I saw him. Yeah, we, he caught a, like an inning. Yeah, it was, it, it it got one no time. offense. It wasn't good. Yeah, and that was not probably fair to him. That's probably on me because of the fact I just threw him back there in a the game. He spent all winter working on the catching. It has improved so much. Uh, our catching group, uh, led by Mike Rebello, has done a really good job. So, watching him catch this spring has been really encouraging. I think the biggest encouragement, and you know, AJ, you and Kratzy would both know this, is that we've added some really good veterans into our group with young kids. We really, I mean, Rowdy's really the only, Rowdy and Brooke are really the only ones in the middle with three or four years service time. The rest of them are kind of on both sides, which is really fun. And I think to your point, yeah, we do have a lot of young, good players, not only guys that are here, but guys that are coming to the big leagues. And uh, it's an encouraging time to be a Pirates fan. Who, what is, what is Gasmani's role going to be when you have a prospect like Henry 
in the sense that you want him to catch. Is Henry going to catch? Do you want him to catch 120 games? Or is it something that you got Yaz here and he can kind of mitigate some of those some of those games too? Yeah, Yaz will definitely mitigate. He's going to start the year on the IL. He's been uh, battling some plantar fasciitis. So he'll start. And then once he comes back, you know, no one catches 120 games anymore. I mean, you know, I don't know what you caught. Times but have changed, Yeah, times know. have changed. So, and I think, you know, adding Yaz was really intentional because of the fact that how he studies, how he prepares, and he's been great for Henry. He, he's in the video room with him. He's talking to him. You know, he's been uh, injured most of the spring, but he sits and watches every single game. He's on the bench. And when he comes back, you know, he's going to be a big part of what we're doing. Yeah, there's not a lot to do in Brayton. There's not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Uh, all right, so what? who's going to be the back of it? Delay? Delay will start the year as the back of it, yeah. And, you know, and he caught a lot for us last year. So I think we're in a pretty good spot with, with catching depth. And we have Andy Rodriguez who had Tommy John and, you know, is going to miss uh, this year. But, you know, we we have some catching depth in the organization. Okay, and then we'll, who's the other? Like, Jared Jones, obviously, I talked about. But O'Neal Cruz is back and ready to go. I mean, I, I saw him walk by me today, and I was like, Damn. Yeah, that's a it's a large human being. He's had a really good spring. I mean, I think he's hit six or seven homers. He's moved at second. He stole ba- or at, around second base at short. He's stolen bases. He's done pretty much everything we could have asked to check off all the boxes. You know, he's played three days in a row. He's played seven innings. Uh, we're excited to have him back because that was a big loss for us last year. What do you talk about? You're not a BS guy. What do you talk about in that clubhouse? Do you talk about winning? Do you talk about the process for these guys? Because you guys brought in a lot of dudes that have done things in their career, and maybe some people will be like, eh, the Pirates, you know, they're a little bit short. How do you tell these guys and convince them, look, we can win in Pittsburgh? The, the word we've used is intentional. We have to be intentional with everything we do. You know, we're not going to go out and bang with people. You know, we're not going to go out and do certain things. But if we're intentional about our work, we're intentional about catching the ball, how we play, making sure we don't give away outs, I think that is the important thing. And, yeah, 100% we talk about winning because we have added. And, you know, like I said, we've added guys that have been in spots that have been on the field at the end of the season. And I'm not talking about the end of a major, or, you know, regular season. I'm talking about the end of the World Series. And that was important for us. So our, our talk is about winning every day. So when you guys had that like crazy start to the season last year, was the feeling in the clubhouse, this is what we can do or how is this happening? Well, I think, you know, if you look back at that start, we pitched probably better than everybody expected, uh, you know, and then we had some injuries that really hurt us, including O'Neal's injury, and we just didn't sustain it. So we have to make sure that when we go through those stretches we have to sustain or we have to be able to minimize those gaps of when we don't play well. Is it going to be pitching based this year? Well, I I mean, I know every team is pitching based, but I mean, honestly, though, the Pirates the last few years have had trouble scoring runs. Yeah. Also, right. So is it more pitching based performance that will help you guys? Because I think you guys have a chance to be better than expected. Or is it going to be, man, we got to figure out a way to score more? runs to help our pitchers out because no pitching staff can go out and go right we're going to give up three a game right and i think back to kratzy's point is like we have to be more intentional last year we did not do as good a job as we should have situationally we have to make sure that when we have those opportunities we score those runs and i think that's a learned thing you know we've added some guys to our group that, that have been run producers which is important but we, we just can't get away those opportunities all right so Kratz, before we let you go Kratz mentioned your V-neck. I mean, it's casual Monday here, Kratz, in the Pirates camp. You know, the V-neck. Today's Monday? But they've also, yes, it is. But they've also, listen, they've changed. Things have changed in the big leagues, okay? They, they're allowed to wear sweats on the plane, I hear. And also, they're flying from Bradenton to Miami. They can't take the four-hour bus ride. So the Pirates now, they fly because, you know, a Stop. four-hour bus ride is Stop. too long for these guys now. Stop, no, we AJ. Are, yeah, we are, we are flying. We're, we're flying down. And uh, I think the, the days, I mean, how often did you like getting in a suit and getting on a plane? Well, I hate it. That's yeah, why we exactly. wore those baggy ass suits with t-shirts. That's, that's why we don't do it. Because when I, I mean, when I came, we had to wear them. Kratzy, you had to wear them. So, yeah, we've gone away from that. Thank you. Good for you. Because AJ's sitting there going, he's saying this just so that he can be the curmudgeon. Just because <laughs> he would have never gotten on a bus. He would have rented a helicopter 
and flown from Bradenton to Miami if the team drove. There's no way. Now, the Pirates of old, they wouldn't have spent. They would have been like, we're not just getting a bus. We're actually making you guys rent cars and drive two by two down down Miami, down to the Alligator Row or whatever it's called. Nah, we're, we're flying today, and, I mean, you know, the, the days of suits are, are over. Oh, hey, before I go, though, I do want to tell Bronny that I met his parents last year. I've been waiting yes. to be on this. Uh, I've been waiting to be on this show to be able to tell you that at a Pirates game last year on the field, walking through BP, and your dad introduced himself. It was a cool moment. Were they recruiting you to try to get you to come on the show? No, this is the first time I got asked. I mean, AJ had to basically storm in my office and, <laughs> and, and demand that I come on the show. So I'm feeling pretty good about it now after the V-neck and the, the comment. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sitting next to him, which you know. That's makes, how that goes. Makes him look better. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did tell me about it. I think it was Pirates Royals late in the season. They said they had a great time chatting with you and appreciated the conversation. And, yes, we would love to have you back when it's not a tornado out there. So let's do it during the season, okay? Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys, and I look forward to coming back on. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. We'll do it. Thanks, Derek. Good to see you. Derek Shelton, Pirates manager with us on FT. Yeah, once we can you know, hear him during the season, we'll get that going as well. Um, all right, let's get back to Charge the Mound and talk about makes and talk about cuts. You want to go positive or negative first? No, oh, always positive first. Okay, so then you take Wyatt Langford to start since he's your dude, and then I'll give you one other on the positive side of making the team, and then we'll go on the negative side of not making the team. Wyatt Langford is a Texas Ranger to start the year. A little DH, a little outfield, a little 320 and 80. I broke it. I broke it with my with my dream. I broke that news. First, <laughs> first to dream it instead of first to tweet it, first to dream it. Eric Kratz here on FT last, I think, Monday or something. Anyway. Give him his credit. Give him his credit. Yeah, yeah. Make, make sure you hashtag me. Hashtag Kratz hats. Um, <laughs> man, like – it's a case where the rich get richer. You know, it's a it's a World Series champion team. Back when I first started, like, trying to make it into the big leagues, I remember a lot of teams that, you know, were World Series contenders from, like, the Phillies in 08, the, the Yankees in 09. And that was right around the time when I was like, ooh, I could make the big leagues. I remember always talking about, oof, man, if I had the year I had and I was with the Phillies in – 08 or the Yankees in 09, like I used to think, no shot. You're not cracking that lineup. That's a World Series winning lineup. And now they got a dude that's going to slot in and play every day after winning the World Series. And they only have gotten a month of Evan Carter. Like I feel like it's it's great for Wyatt Langford. It's awesome for him. I think he's his swing plays with his plate discipline and his ability to drive the ball to all fields. But I just think for the Rangers, man, like I am taking the over in their games for sure. Yeah, good call. I mean, this was the number four overall pick last year, 2023. But go for it. What's the worst that happens? Struggle City for a few weeks. You go down, you come back up as if he couldn't handle that. If that absolutely happened, which it's probably not going to happen. This dude's up. He's up for good. Right? I mean, he was crushing spring training. And it's if AJ were on, he would say spring training doesn't matter. It does matter for certain people. It matters how you go out there and the at-bats that you put together and the at-bats you put together in certain situations. If you're going out there and you hit six dingers and you have seven or eight RBI, eh, you know what, you're just you're you're kind of feasting on guys who aren't necessarily being able to get you out in a situation. Everybody goes to the well, pitchers, goes to the well in spring training. They're going to try to get you out with guys on base. And he has constantly delivered. He's delivered on slow breaking balls, curve balls. He's delivered on cutters the other way. And he's delivered on heaters. It looks like you can't – it's tough to get a heater by him. And when you control the zone and you do damage on all those pitches, it's, it's a recipe for a guy that, to me, looks like – the situation's not too big. He goes 0 for 4 in his first game. I'm not going to panic. He goes, you know, a slow first month where he's hitting 200. I'm not going to panic because I don't think he needs to have the pressure 
to carry this lineup because the lineup's already legit. Exactly. And I know he'll get some DH time and some left field, most likely. And he can play. This isn't like a case of, say, an Aloy Menez where you're like, mm, it's better off being a DH. Let's preserve the body. He's not a good defender. This guy's going to be fine out there. They just have depth out there as well, you know? So that's part of the problem here. It's a good problem to have because you know how baseball works. In five minutes, there's an injury, and then you're like, oh, well, Lankford can just play full-time out there now, which is quite nice. So, And this was what, and this was a team, before you said that, before you go into Jackson, this was a team that we talked about, okay, DHing. Uh, Hannah Kaiser's write, hopefully writing an article about DHing and how some teams didn't spend. This team was, was crying poor most of the offseason because of the RSN stuff, real or not real. This team has the ability to, to, to not need a DH because of what they have in their lineup and because of the fact that you can pull a rookie up and bounce him from left to right to left to right to giving guys like Seeger, you know, they're, they're going to have a, I'm not sure who, who it is, but somebody that can fill in at shortstop to give him some DHs. This team, to me, I agree, does not need a DH. And last part on this, I, I want to give credit to someone, but I don't remember who wrote it. But I put it in my notes, nice little stat. So David Murphy had a down 2013. You're like, where am I going here? Signed with Cleveland after departing Texas. Since that time period, after David Murphy left Texas in 2013, they had 57 players manning left field for the Rangers over a 10-year span. 57 players. And the guy who logged the most time out there was Willie Calhoun, which was 1,282 innings, which is about 142 games. So they have been looking for more of a consistent plan out there, and they have one because Langford and Carter alone should be handling two outfield spots for the next five to ten years, depending on what happens with them in their free agent life or their extension life if you're a Rangers fan and you're hoping that's the case. So a little bit of uh, solidarity out there for the first time in a minute. I'm here for any any time we talk about David Murphy. Any time Murph was a fall league teammate, just a consummate pro, big league hitter, big league hitter, but just always happy, always sneaky big guy. But David Murph, ugh, Red Sox prospect coming up. Played fall league together. Just always happy. In the weeds we go. So we learned more details about Shohei Otani's translator over the weekend. Ipe caught in a storm of lies. And also, we're going to hear from Shohei Otani later today. So we'll be able to react to that either later today or tomorrow. Also, keep in mind, Dodgers territory makes its debut later today on the Foul Territory Network. You can watch it live with Alana Rizzo and Clint Basias. It's a big week in the Dodgers world. So Otani's going to speak, but let's focus on Ipe for a moment because this is the person presumably causing all of the problems. And if you look back at his past, Kratz, it is checkered because he is lying. He said that he went to UC Riverside. UC Riverside said he did not go there. Not did not graduate there, did not go to school there. He said that he worked for the Boston Red Sox as a translator. The Red Sox came out and said he never worked for us. There was some Yankees talk in there too about spring training. Not really sure if that's true either. There are a lot of lies here. I also was listening to Carl Ravitch go over this on the radio the other day because he was out there when the story broke. And I hadn't seen this anywhere else, but he said that Ipe addressed the team and the team was super pissed because they said that he lied. And then obviously he got fired five seconds later. So there's just a sea of lies. And obviously he really hurt someone that trusted him. We'll see how everything else plays out. But we are learning that this is someone who has been doing the resume embellishing, actually taking it to another level. It's just fakeresume.com right now. It's it's crazy. I, and obviously, all of his stuff is going to get out there. So, you know, before anybody jumps to conclusions, like if you have never done anything wrong, then you can be the first to 
throw stones at Ipe. But this is somebody that clearly has not a troubled past, but built built what he built on, you know, kind of a rocky ground. Like he, he definitely like to be lying on your resume to get jobs. I would say a lot of people probably do that. And they're looking for opportunities to get into a space. Maybe they feel like that's the only way they can get into it. I have never heard anything until last week when all this came out bad about Ipe from translators that I asked to try to connect with him to players who played with Shohei and had connections with Ipe to even his new Dodger teammates talking about on this show how Ipe is awesome. Oh, yeah, Ipe was with Shohei. And so it's one of those things I hope people don't don't mistrust people just because of this situation. But clearly the stuff that's coming out about him is it's troubling, but it's also kind of, it's damning evidence to show that, you know, there's, there's something going on for him. And I think over the next weeks, months, we're going to get more information. And I hope Shohei doesn't become more guarded because of this situation. Cause he already seems like a pretty guarded person. Yeah, I think it'll be good for him to try and, you know, kind of explain what's going on here so that there is less speculation. That's when it's important for someone to speak about their own account of what's going on. I think uncovering some of the lies here, Cratch, just helps to tell the story that this is a dishonest person. Pleasant person to be around, spoken of highly for all the dealings that he's had in public with fans, media, teammates, etc. Right. Talking about Ipe here. But yep. he's lied a lot. It just makes it easier to tell a story that that he's caught up in a lot more than most people realized. And and from Shohei's standpoint, I don't know that he's necessarily like known about all this. He's known maybe about some of the things with the money and you know other issues. But you're talking about all that is I've seen written is this was his best friend. This was the guy, he was everywhere with him. We hit on it a little bit last week about an interpreter's job throughout the season is not just showing up to the park. It's going to get food. It's running errands together. It's everything they do is together. And if somebody is a liar, this proficient of a liar, to say that he worked for two teams and the Yankees one hasn't been disputed because the person he was translating for was actually didn't pass the physical so he could have been there in camp with them anyway these are not the only lies this person is saying and Shohei looking like maybe he doesn't quite know what's going on or he's he's sitting there like oh how could Shohei make this mistake seems like this guy is a really good liar and he has lived this lie and Shohei's lived with him so it's you know to me, it makes Shohei look less culpable. Yeah, he's a victim here, and there's an MLB investigation going on right now. All right, let's table that, and let's go back out to Pirates camp. AJ, sitting next to our friend Jack Sawinski, joining us right now. Oh, okay, a little sheltered now. That's better. Jack, how you doing, man? You got a game today? Oh, wait, we don't hear him yet. Hold on, Jack. We had to do a very quick location change dealing with the wind out there. So let's just make sure we can hear him. We'll go right back out to Jack in just a sec. Um, hours to go. And then the guys wow. leave spring training. Four hours left of camp. What a great day. And also, from my standpoint, what a brutal day. When you get brought over as the backup catcher on the last day of camp, everybody is in great spirits and just – sucks because you know everybody's getting on a big league flight and you're about to go to Indianapolis and you're checking the weather in Indy and you're like womp, womp. 38 <laughs> 38 windy no batter's eye struggle bus and the pirates are going to Miami oh talk about everybody's just in such a good mood everybody's in such a good mood there's no like <sighs> okay Am I getting cut? Is it Am on? I... We can hear. Yeah, you. I think we hear you now, AJ. You good? Oh yeah. Hello. Can you hear Jack? Oh yeah. 
Yes, we do. All right, let's do this. Jack, what's up, dude? You ready for the last few uh, hours of summer camp? Yeah, this this, this is it. This is it. Last day right here. So what's that like? Are you guys excited? Yeah, yeah, everyone's pretty excited. Uh, Obviously, the last day is, you know, a little different. So guys tend to do a little less, start packing up and, you know, get to this game and then we're out of here. Where are you hitting today? Uh, four. Four. Oh, four. Yeah. Four. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Hey, uh, I got to ask you this before we get too, too deep into this interview. 2028 Olympics, Poland. Yeah. You in? Are you doing it? You in? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Gold medal. <laughs> Gold medal. That'd be confirmed sick. Confirmed already. That'd be sick. <laughs> AJ's been uh, recruiting heavy and he has not gotten a no yet. So he stays oh, on the that's field. Oh, he did get a no. He did get a no. What's his name said? He wanted to play for Team USA instead of oh, Poland. No. <laughs> who was that? True. I forget him. who that was. It was someone no. whose their name was short. Oh, it was uh, uh, Lau, Brandon Lau. Oh, Brandon oh. Lau. That's right. That's right. Because oh. he's like Lewazinski, but he changed it to Lau. And I'm oh. like, oh, Team Poland. He said, no, USA has to oh. drilling him yeah. first pitch. <laughs> for sure. For sure. <laughs> Hey, hey Jack, I want I want you know our national international audience to get to know the Pirates a little better. So well, let's start with the pitching staff. For example, Jared Jones makes the team. Can you tell me yeah. what he's like and give us a scouting report? Because he could be a Rookie of the Year candidate. I know everyone was ready to hand Yamamoto the award already, but he had a rough start. Um, yeah, Jared's awesome. You know, as a human being, he's a little quiet, little reserved, but he's a great guy. You know, I I uh, see him around the locker room a lot and been chatting with him more. And more, but on the field, you know, obviously throw throws fuel. Um, so I'm excited for him to be be on the team and watch what he can do this year. Did you uh, did you talk to him before you knew he was making a team, or did you go AJ style and you're like, ah, eh, whatever, I'll talk to you when you get called <laughs> up. And now that he's in the big leagues, you're like, hey, what's up, JJ? You get like yeah. a nickname and all that stuff. <laughs> No, I I I, uh, I talked to him a little bit out of the field because we've we've hung out a couple times. Oh, you did talk to him. Yeah, I've talked to him. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Dude, you gotta learn how to be a big leaguer. Bro. <laughs> Just big ignore him all. <laughs> oh, you're on the team opening day. Uh, yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. By the way, what's your name? What, you, what position do you play? That's funny. <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of that. I mean, this is one of the younger teams, and there, there's some other really. You know, impressive pitching prospects. So what about the hitting side of things? Can you give us a scouting report about what the lineup looks like right now? And obviously this team didn't have O'Neill Cruz for most of the season, so it'll help to have that power, right? Yeah, obviously O'Neill's back. He's healthy. He's had a pretty good spring, you know, just back to himself, mashing balls all over the place, which is fun to watch. So we're excited to have him. Um, but yeah, throughout the lineup, we have some new additions too, and we're excited for that. And then, you know, a couple – couple guys at the you know key brian coming back obviously they're anchors in our lineup so you know they're gonna do some damage and you know we've been talking about it we feel like we got a good lineup you know all the way through and feel like we could just turn that thing over a lot jack you recently got engaged right yeah yeah i did was it on instagram i did there was a little post on instagram yeah you you did that here right that was here yeah oh man yeah recent i i I got some advice for you (laughs) (laughs) See? <laughs> good luck <laughs> that's not advice yeah that's definitely not advice do not listen to anything no. he says and then tell him that you're not playing for him anymore yeah 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 he's out he's on Poland. For me. He he just lost a choice. that was a sign sealed delivered contract yeah yeah <laughs> hey w- jack what do you think about the nl central and the chances of the pirates you know, taking the division, let alone obviously a wild card conversation. I know, you know, it's been tough times for this franchise for several years now, but the NL Central like wasn't very aggressive this offseason as a whole. I would say less aggressive than anticipated. The Brewers probably will take a step back. I mean, the Reds made some nice moves in the offseason. Cardinals added some starting pitching. Cubs weren't crazy. So do you guys look at this division and say, hey, nobody's going nuts in terms of how they spent and added veterans and Maybe we can make some noise this time. Yeah, I mean, there weren't like super big moves um, from what we saw, obviously. Um, But yeah, a lot of guys are, you know, excited. And the group that we have, you know, coming into camp, just a lot of guys pretty fired up, actually. And, you know, just go out there and pretty much do what we want to do and do what we know how to do. And I think we'll have a pretty good shot of, you know, 
getting up there in division. And, you know, we obviously want to get to playoff games and win playoff games. Dude, you guys made moves? I don't know what he's talking about. You guys made right in Martin Perez. Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah. I, well, he's about talking about the I talked about the rest yeah. of the division. The rest, the rest of the division was lame. I mean, the Reds did a couple things, but, I mean, the Pirates yeah. were the movers and shakers in this yeah. division. Yeah, good ones, too. And everyone Cuban I've talked to there. here, everyone I've talked to here in camp is, like, super, super excited about the opportunity in the division. And, you know, listen, if things fall right, we guys won, what, 76 games last year, right? Yeah. 84 went to the World Series, Scott. That's yeah. all I'm saying. 84 got to the World Series last year. Yeah, it's true. Jack, what I want to know, I don't care about this baseball stuff. <laughs> How did the proposal go? Were you like uh, yeah. Were you like one teammate that I played with who was playing Xbox and sent a picture of a ring to his fiance <laughs> and said, Will you marry me? And that's how I got engaged? Or did wow. you like fly a plane and oh. jump out of it with a sign that said, Will you marry me? No, it was like right in the middle of both of those. Uh, okay. We just we had an off day, so we just hung out all day. Uh, went over to the island, to the beach. Uh, just hung out, you know, kicked it for a little while. Had an early dinner. Um, and then we just walked over to the beach, sat over there for sunset. And then, you know, I just stood up and asked her the question. You know, I tried to at least. I started, started tearing up, started crying a little bit. And, you know, she was like, this is either going to be really good or, or really bad right now based on your emotions but um yeah she was pretty surprised it was it was really nice it was sunset at the beach and she loves the beach so did she know did she know it was coming no she said she does she doesn't know that it was coming but i think um i think there might you know might be a little bit of knowing okay and then maybe and then when when you were done did you have a professional photographer and all that or did you um, Insta- like i said there was instagram posts they were good yeah there were good ones no uh my parents were here and her mom was here so they were they were hiding a little bit, so they had my location on the phone. So uh, they were just tracking us all day. And then uh, once I knew they were there, uh, they just came out what after. What happens if the sun would have set before you? Because you know, as Polish people, you know, sometimes we're not. They were close. Out. They were cutting okay, it. Like good. I had like twenty minutes of daylight left. Um, but it was it was a great sunset that day, so it, it worked out really well. And she's from where? She's from Pittsburgh. So w- she knows like you can go to a different team, right? What's that? She, you could go to a different team. Oh yeah. Will she still love you if you get traded or get you know go to a different team? Yeah, I I, I hope so. <laughs> she says she would. She says she would. She okay. said she would. I we mean, covered. You know, we covered that. Pittsburgh fans are kind of crazy about their team, so I don't know. Yeah. You know, she she could just be like yeah, like McCutcheon's wife. I think is from Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. Maria. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, he yeah. went to a bunch of different yeah. teams and he came back. So yeah. maybe they fell out. That's why he just had another kid. Oh yeah. Because he came back to Pittsburgh. She's like, no kids. So you go back to the Pirates. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah maybe. Well, sure, that's what that I was going to say. That's what I was going to say because she's she's got to know what she's getting into because she didn't know you were crying. She didn't know <laughs> were you going to break up with her because, you know what, I'm probably going to hit 40 dingers this year uh, or are you going wow. to stay with me? But now she's got – I mean, she, she thinks this is like the greatest. Like she found herself a pirate and most likely – the Pirates aren't going to sign you for a long-term extension because that's not what the Pirates do. So they're going to trade. Is she prepared for that, like AJ said? I mean, really prepared? Um, Probably not, like, really prepared. Um, <laughs> I think it's a more, like, if it happens, then, like, reality hits kind of thing. Um, but she does know that I could, like, I could end up on the West Coast or, you know, somewhere else. So she's... She's been like, so you can just get traded at any point, right? I'm like, yeah. So she's <laughs> she's into it. She knows her stuff. She knows her baseball pretty good. Is she a Steeler okay, fan? Right too? Yeah. Um, well, in a so fan. well, um, her dad is from Boston, so she grew up a Patriots fan. Ooh. Yeah. So. Hey, Jack, I, I got a fan you know. question. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm I'm gonna take you off the uh, the relationship hot seat. You nailed it there. Sure. So let's get back on the field. Um, some fans in the chat want to know about stolen base goals for you. I believe you were 13 for 15 last year. Did you feel like there's more in the tank based on what the new rules are bringing to the table? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we started off like as a team running pretty heavy last year, and then I know it slowed down just a little bit. Um, so I think if we just carry some of that momentum, then I think 
I think we could see a lot of guys on this team, you know, get get a lot of bases. Um, obviously, we have some quicker guys who are, you know, going to steal a lot of bases. But I think, you know, we could push that number, bump that number up a little bit this year. That'd be pretty cool. 30-30? 30-30. Wow. Yeah, you said it. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about it. Like You're the first Polish like guy that. ever to go 30-30. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, Jack, it was awesome having you on, dude. Good luck in the game, and uh, enjoy the get end the split up. of yep. spring training. Get, the split, up. get yep. the split up today, right, Crouchy? Yeah. Who is it? It's Gosman. Yeah. Oh. That's a dinger. Yep. That's a dinger waiting to happen. <laughs> I don't know. Wind's blowing hard in today. I don't know. Though. Is he really? Is Gosman pitching? That's a rowdy yeah. seven. Rowdy's yeah. probably wrong. Oh, Gosman's yeah. pitching for yeah. the Blue Jays? Yeah, he's yeah. working back from the shoulder issue. They're trying to oh, get him ready not to be on time. I was yeah. like, wait, they start Thursday. He's like, yeah, but he Thursday. had a shoulder issue. So what they're oh. trying to do is get him in a position that he can at least pitch for them, even if you know he pitches a few days into the season on a limited pitch count. But if he gives up two Jack Stawinski homers, he might be like, yo, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> Ruin his day. Ruin <laughs> his day, Jack. Yeah, last day. Last day. <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you, Jack. We'll get you during the season, all right? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Appreciate you. Jack Sawinski joining us from Pirates Camp. That's yeah, the, That shirt was fire, too, that he was wearing. I like that, like, mustard yellow undershirt. Little Looked like a little camo. Love that. It was great. Okay, we're going to go back to Charge the Mound, because for some reason I had, um, like, a brain... Brain fart? Fart, I guess. Sure. And I forgot to shout out the other two players, and I just moved on to the That's next That's why topic. we went positive. That's why we went positive first, because you never know. You may not ever get it. That's why you eat dessert first. You know what? You never know when you're going to go. You know what? We had a crazy week last week. I mean, in a good way. We, just, we announced a lot of things. We were doing the Korea Series post-game shows. The Tani story was sweeping the world. So after the Friday show... I went and got a big ass ice cream sundae. I did, and it was for lunch. I was I was on the Kratz plan. I was like, yeah, you know what? It's time. It's right now. The lactose free ice cream. Nine thirty at night. Oh yeah, yeah. They they were bringing it. This place was insane. Even well, when for you invite people me down, that don't have allergies. When you invite me down after you know nine years on the show, whenever the first time you invite me to Orlando, because I haven't been invited ever since we started this show. So I would fun. love to hit up that ice cream shop with I would some lactose-free ice cream. It is incredible for anybody. It doesn't matter, you know, what allergies or what you're into. As long as you like ice cream, ice this cream. is the spot. Yeah, exactly. Um, by the way, open invitation at all times. That goes for everyone. Barely anyone ever visits me. You would think <laughs> I'm living in Siberia, but I'm actually in Orlando and a really nice setup down here. It's, it's very pleasant and beautiful downtown. Anyway... Uh, let's go over the two charge the mound topics that I missed by accident. One, Sixto Sanchez, A plus name, back in the big leagues. I love this. He was so fun to watch back in 2020, his rookie season. He has not pitched in the big leagues since 2020. He's had multiple shoulder surgeries. He's only 25 years old now. He pitched seven shutout innings in spring, gave up one hit. And he will be on the big league roster. It sounds like he'll be a reliever. Maybe he'll be able to kind of stretch out as more of a multiple inning reliever and eventually get himself back to a rotation. But you just want to see this guy pitch in the big leagues at this point. This is a case of a righty who's undersized. And he plays to what many teams will say when they're drafting undersized right-handed pitchers. I don't know. He might get hurt. They do point to examples like this. And I will say, Kratz, because you saw him in the Phillies organization, that was the knock. They're like, dude, this guy's got Pedro Martinez stuff, but I don't know if he'll be able to stay on the field. And unfortunately, he hasn't for three, four years. So it's awesome to see him back. He's got a lot of career left ahead of him. I hope that as we continue to learn more about shoulder injuries, he's able to sustain a big league career. And the Marlins freaking need him because they're going through a ton of pitching injuries right now. Think about that rotation. We played them in 2020 to end the season. Right during the COVID season, they clinched a spot in Yankee Stadium. They clinched a playoff spot in Yankee Stadium, and we were already in the playoffs. And you had Alcantara, and you had Sixto, and you were sitting there going, whoa, what a one-two punch for the playoffs. And I remember, yes, he's a short guy, but this dude is – a large human, just, just 
barrel chested, huge dude that you're like, oh my goodness, like the Phillies gave that up for one year of JT Real Muto? Like the Phillies were getting absolutely roasted at that point. They were saying, why would you give that up? This is, you know, this is unbelievable. Just another Phillies bad mistake. Hasn't turned out that way. They extended JT Real Muto. They ended up, it ended up being another Marlins, you know, blunder getting rid of, you know, their superstars from Real Muto, from, from Yelich, from Ozuna, from Giancarlo, and this looked like another one, but what an amazing, amazing opportunity for this guy. Four years, four years after he first was Rookie of the Year candidate, I think he got seventh in Rookie of the Year, like leads his team to the playoffs, and now he gets an opportunity in the big leagues again. To me, this is what is great about baseball that I don't think happens in other sports. You don't see this happening in other sports. And I hope he debunks all the theories and stay – or all the all the little short short pitcher theories and stays healthy. I do too. Props to him. Yeah, he's, he's about probably 5'11-ish. I think he's listed – I'm trying to find – listed six feet. And yeah, he was, he was pumping 96 on the fastball this spring training. Now, in 2020, his average fastball velo was 98.6. 96 yeah. topping out at 99 in spring training this year though that plays <laughs> that, that, that'll work so we'll see what he looks like he's out of options so he's got to be on the big league roster so you can't send him down under any circumstances and if he's healthy i mean it's a big league pitcher it's not like he needs to develop more it's just coming back from multiple sh- shoulder surgeries it's really the the worst injury that a pitcher can have right now would you agree 100 percent, 100 percent. and that's why when i saw the velocity back up there that's huge. It's not gonna. It's not gonna reach where he was, but his peak was elite, elite. Okay, now let's get into the negative side of things, and I want opinions from our friends in the chat. I was pissed off when I saw that Jackson Holiday didn't make the team. Pissed off. The only thing in my mind that you could point to is the strikeout to walk ratio, but still, I mean, he crushed every level of the minor leagues. Gets to spring training and. I'll get you the final numbers. 314, 354, 600 slug. Two homers, two stolen bases in 15 games. 15 strikeouts with three walks. Sure. That's not great. And the team said that they'd like him to get more reps at second base. They want more at-bats against left-handed pitching because there wasn't much of that in the upper levels of the minors. I get all of that. I get it. But Jim Michael Elias said in the wintertime that he has a very strong possibility to make the team. And he said he was very close. But for me, it smells like service time. I'm sorry, it does. It smells like service time. Are you going to disagree with me on this? Really? I am. I am. So, so if they call him up in whatever that number is, 19 days or whatever the BS number is that gets them another year of service time for a Scott Boris client that might take himself to free agency one day and not sign one of those extensions with the Orioles, they get the player for seven years instead of six. And yes, you can get an extra draft pick. The incentives are there these days. But that draft pick comes if you have the player on at the beginning of the year and he finishes, what is it, top two, I believe, the, the two teams for rookie of the two year? Two or three. Two or three, whatever it is. And there's competition in the AL. Cole Keith's going to have a good year, most likely. Wyatt Langford, et cetera. Um, Evan Carter. But to me... This player could be top five in our sport in a heartbeat. And to get an extra year out of that player on the back end is worth tens of millions of dollars. So you're a good ball club. You're favored in your own mind, at least, to win the division. You're full of depth. And you wait a few weeks, and then you bring him up. Go ahead. Bite back. I don't disagree with him. I don't disagree with him. This is a baby at his position let alone a baby in the game. Like, it's not like a Chris Bryant. Like, you would have have to do a lot of convincing to me to say, oh, this is definite service time manipulation. There's plenty of real reasons. Like, the most recent one that comes to my mind is Chris Bryant. Chris Bryant came out of college. He did not come out of high school a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, he was finishing up his high school season. I know he's got big league pedigree. I know he did really well. 
And I know like his strikeout to walk ratio in spring training doesn't bother me. He almost was, he was almost one to one in his minor league season last year as a 19 year old. To me, this is a case where it's okay that he goes back down. He goes back down. He gets more reps at second base. He's going to Norfolk. His division in Norfolk, it's not that cold. You're not putting him in any situation where he's not close to the big leagues. Now, you know what? If it's 17 days into the season and they call him up, then I'm going to be like, that was shady. That was shady. But I do think he may need more time. And this is a case where they don't have to bring him up so soon. They don't have to. I think it would be jumping the gun if they don't feel like he's ready. And I trust Brandon Hyde and that coaching staff because I know some of the dudes on there are very, very good big league experience coaches and they know what they have. I think Kowser made the team. Is it Kowser that made the team? Yes, and Colton Kowser made have, the team. They have enough in the minor leagues to be able to – like this roster is really good and they don't need to bring him up for the first month. First two months, maybe. Get a lot of reps at second base. He's going to hit. Nobody's denying that. But I am not against this move. So he can't handle second base right now? Do, what what is the that. best looking What is the best looking roster for the Orioles? To me, it's Jackson Holiday on this team from day one. He's ready. And I think he'd get a 300 in the big leagues right now, tomorrow. I do. Okay. I feel confident about that. And I think, I think they're going to call him up in a few weeks. And they're going to say, oh, you know... Now we feel like he's ready or there'll be some injury that saves the day for them. And then we're going to go, yeah, we know. We know what you did here. I'm telling if there's you, an injury, see it. If, there, if there's an injury, hey, he's your, best, he's your best guy to call up. Somebody has to be the 27th man. And I think too many times the service manipulation stuff is the first thought that everybody has. And I don't know that necessarily this is the case, but we will see. I mean, there shouldn't be benefit of the doubt. It's something that plagued our sport for a long time. Players were getting kept down so that they can get an extra year out of them. But and I not, get it. He's super young. I know. I know. But I just think he was ready. I think that he was one of the 26 best players in the organization, and there was a spot for him. Because him you start saw the him team on ground opening balls at a, at a keystone position. Not a keystone position, but a, a supplemental keystone position. Yes. He's a natural shortstop, and he looked fine at second base. I saw enough reps. He wasn't a disaster over there. He was good. So what's the problem? You want more reps? Cool. He can get more reps in the big leagues. So what if what if Kowser, what if Kowser hits 300 in April? What does Kowser have to do with Holiday? The guy who's who's up there in his place. I mean, not up there in his place, but it's He's another. He's not in his place, though. He's in the outfield. In another, another, another young guy that's taking up a roster spot. My, I will say, well, Holiday could have done that too. And they better have the best record in all of Major League Baseball and have home field van advantage throughout. Because if they miss out on home field advantage throughout the entire freaking Major Leagues by two to three games, it'll be because they didn't have Holiday up to start the year. Sorry, that's just me. I'm very against it. And I'm, I'm calling BS. I think in a few weeks they're going to call him up and it's going to be BS. Let's get back to our guest. We're going to go to Pirates Camp right now. And we're going to talk to a player who made the ball club, and we're pumped about this. Jared Jones joining us right now from Pirates Camp. First off, congratulations, Jared, on making the team. You're a big leaguer. How does that sound? Thank you, man. It's awesome. Uh, I got the news yesterday, and, you know, it was an emotional day. I got to call my parents, call call all my family and friends, and it was, it was just a great day. Did they do anything cool to tell you? Uh, I was in the office with Ben and Shelton yesterday, and uh, they go, so we want to do right by you. You only threw 120 innings the past two years. Like, it doesn't make sense for me to throw 200 innings this year. And I was like, oh, man, they're sending me back down to AAA. Like, I, I understand it. But uh, I just wanted them to rip the Band-Aid off. And then Shelton looks at me and goes, congratulations, man. I go, what? So you're, you're coming with us to Miami. And I was like, oh, my God. It's, this is awesome. Yeah, it's great. And I love that Shelton was like, by the way, you're, uh, you're not making the team. <laughs> just kidding. You actually are making the team. What did they? You're going to start, obviously. Yeah. Do you know what day, which spot? Yeah, game three in Miami. Game three. So is that Saturday? Yeah. Oh, parents, everyone coming in. Yep, they're all coming in. Oh, you, have you started to like 
bubble a little bit inside yeah i get i get those moments but then it, it still just doesn't feel real to me i think once i've stepped foot in the stadium then it's gonna hit a little bit better but you think you'll be more nervous warming up or when you actually get on the mound because you're the worst part is your visitors right yeah so you have to sit there you warm up you walk because in miami you have to walk all the way across the mm -hmm. field right so they'll have the club behind you bumping and you'll be like oh man there's, there's music going <laughs> you warm up you walk across hopefully your team scores you about five and then when you then you got to go out there. So you think you'll be more nervous when you warm it up or when you actually step out on the mound? I think it's warming up. Warming up, I've always had those pregame jitters, but once I get on the mound, it's it's go time for me. Okay. All right. Who did you call first? Who was the first phone call? I called my dad. He was at work. He had his safety goggles on. Uh, he works works at this place called West Rock out in California. He had his safety goggles on. I go, hey, dad. And uh, I, I had tears in my eyes, and I just cracked a smile and said that, and he knew exactly what, what, what was going on. Jared, what were the chances that you were going to get a positive answer like this? Did you think heading into the meeting that you were going to get a thumbs up and kind of take me through the play-by-play -play of the spring training time period of, you know, how likely you thought this was going to happen? Yeah, so – when we first got down here and everyone uh, got down, oh, first day of uh, spring training, uh, I was called into a meeting for uh, for uh, Shelton and Charrington, and they said, you're going to have a chance all year long. Da, 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 da. And, uh, yeah, from there on, I kind of just took my step forward and uh, pitched the way how I pitched and everything panned out. But I always thought it was a 50-50 chance, but ended up working out. You're not on the roster, right? You're not on the 40-man roster? No. So they got to add you. Yeah. Okay. But – what was the what was the step? You're throwing 100. Was that the next step? Was like you're like I'm gonna throw 97 to 100, and that's what they were looking for. I mean, because I don't think you gave up an earned run this spring, did you? No, I didn't. Um, I've always thrown hard. I think it was just the uh, third and fourth pitches taking their strides in game, and which is what the cur the curveball and changeup. Okay, so your fastball slider, curveball, changeup in yeah. that order. Yeah, got it. All right. And by the way, Kratzy Scott, he's like you. He's listed at six foot one, and I'm like six foot one. <laughs> Wait, I think they might have – maybe a little bit. 6-1 with shoes no. on and cleats and spikes and spikes. Exactly. Six one with them on the exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's what counts. Tell them. Yeah. So uh, what did your what did your teammates say? Like who, who have you made friends with and you know, what did they say when you found out that you were going to be, you know, able to spend a lot more time with them in the bigs? Yeah, so my locker roommate or my locker mate right now is uh, Josh Fleming, and he was he was the most pumped for me. Uh, we obviously spent the most time with each other, just just talking here and there while we we're out in our locker. And then Mitch was pumped for me. Bednar was the first person I saw right when I got told, and he was he was pumped. But yeah, what did Rowdy say? Uh, Rowdy just looked at me and he goes two thumbs up, and I go two thumbs up, and he gave me a big old hug. Uh -huh. All right. yeah. Make sure he make sure he buys you dinner all year. <laughs> yeah, he's making what about, a million. What about your what about your minor league teammates who got fired these last few days? How have you had any interaction with those guys? Because that's where I come from. Like I'm always the dude. I'm like, hey, good job, good job. I won't see you in Indy. Like I'm not going down to Indy with you know you're not you're staying in the big leagues. Do you interact with those guys or is that too awkward? No, yeah, we did. Uh, we went to dinner last night. I went to dinner with Skeens and uh, Sean Sullivan, and they both congratulated me there. And uh, we've got a couple of my friends here who are backing up the game today. They gave me some congratulations. And then just the friends back home um, went to high school with. I, I called them all as soon as I got done calling my family, and they were like, dude, no way. It's awesome. Just give me my congratulations. How many people are coming to Miami? I don't know, but I'm, I'm sure there's a few. All right. Playing okay. for free. Playing for free. Skeen by the way, I hope Skeens bought dinner with the amount of money he's made. He made already, already. <laughs> Skeens is LSU rich. We, we yeah, know. He took, a pay cut. he took a pay cut to come to Pittsburgh. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Jared, when do you start prepping for your start? Like, you know, on a normal um, time period, when do you do that? And in this situation, you're like, damn, all right, I'm going to start looking up the Marlins hitters, or you have a certain routine that you're trying to follow. I, I try and keep it less game like as possible until like the day before day of like uh I'll, I'll be I'll, I'll be out there watching the games obviously taking mental notes on what hitters like to do and what they don't like to do and then uh I'll have a sit down meeting with the guy who's catching me and the, some of the coaches and see what the plan of attack is the day of and day before do you look at somebody and say this is how they attacked him I'm gonna fall like would you like Mitch Keller will you watch him throw opening day and be like 
okay, he attacked him this way. I'm going to be similar or – I mean, I think Marco's game too, right, Marco? So mm-hmm. he's obviously a soft throwing lefty or a little bit different guys. So do you watch Mitch? Will you talk to Mitch after his start? Or is there someone that you've looked in the minor leagues and said, hey, this is the guy I want to be like? Yeah, I, we ha- I have my own identity, um, how I want to go about it and how I want to throw to hitters and stuff like that. But uh, Mitch is definitely a guy I'll definitely be looking at, uh, seeing what he does to guys, just taking notes from him and see how he goes about his day. All right, I should know this, but I don't. Where were you committed to go to college? I was committed to Texas, Longhorns. You dis, You think you made the right choice now that you are on the cusp of making your first big league start and your your boy Paul Skeens is down, he's going to Indianapolis or maybe even Altoona. Who knows where they're, where they're sending him. But do you feel like you made the right choice? I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, I, made, I made some really good friends and – the places I've been to have been really cool. Um, some of the small cities in the in the lower levels are obviously really interesting. But yeah, I, w- I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, Jared, tell me about um, I guess besides your your locker mate, of course, in Fleming, other guys that that you've made friends with. I know it's mostly a young ball club, but you know you do have yes, the Rowdies, the McCutcheons. Uh, have spent any time with Araldis Chapman? Dude's got stories. Yeah, I've spent some time with uh, mostly the pitchers. Um, got kind of a, a new, te- a newer team here. Um, but yeah, some of the newer. I've spent time with Rowdy. He's he's been on my case a bit, but it's all fun and games. Uh, but yeah, it's mostly just been with most of the pitchers. Yeah, you pitchers. I don't know. A lot of pitchers stick to themselves. They like, they don't want to. Pitchers don't want to venture out. They don't want to talk to the <laughs> position. It's just weird to me. Like you know, the other guys are on your team too. Like when you're pitching on Saturday, guess what? you're going to be rooting your ass off for like Rowdy to get a hit. So, you know, like yeah. talk to him before Saturday and be like, Hey guys, like the other four days you're not pitching. Like you still cheer for the guys. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> what's your, what's hey, your song going to yeah. be? You're, you're a rookie in the show. Like you're going to have to be called to the bus, especially you're up there the whole year. Like it's not going to, you're going to have a whole year of like maybe like three or four songs. Do you have anything go to or like a skit that you can perform in the front of the bus? Uh, I was told I got to sing a song in the plane later today, so I, I got to do some brainstorming on that one. What's your what do you got? What, what's going to be your go-to? I listen to everything. I, I'm, I'm looking at some of the shorter songs, so I might do uh, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. That, that's, that's, I think that's a pretty good song. Good start. Good start, but you don't want to be thrown into the banyo, man. If you're not good, yeah. you got you to take the rest of the ride. And that Miami ride, it's not short. You don't want to be in the banyo for the rest of the ride. Yeah. Yeah, I know. You got to do something Miami vibes too. Like you're you're going to South Beach, man. It's got to be, I don't know. Make it make it happen, Miami, bitch. (laughs) That actually would be fire. They'd be like, "Who is this guy? (laughs) We're winning game three. (laughs) If you sent the clubhouse guy out to get like glow sticks and you passed him out, and you're like, "Well, Miami, bitch." (laughs) Yeah, you shut the lights off in the plane. Every city you're going to, you need to learn the most iconic song from that city. Like when you yeah. guys go back out home, when you guys go home, when you go to Cali, you know. Got to do some Oilers or some Mac Miller. Or some Tupac or Biggie. Yeah. 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 Any of that. Yeah. You got to be creative. Yeah, these are I mean, pretty like, good when you suggestions. you go to Cleveland, you know, you sing Kenny Chesney, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of songs, that, you know. Pitts, I'm trying to think of a Pittsburgh song. What's a Pittsburgh song? Ugh. Black and West yellow, West. black and yellow, black and yellow, there black and go. yellow. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. What about yeah, John like Denver? That. Country roads? That's kind of close, right? That's West a good Virginia, one. Virginia, but yeah, okay. I, I, I like it. Black and, yellow is, black and yellow is fire. Um, I, I got a question for you about your, your pitching friend. So you mentioned Skeens, and there's Anthony Solomedo, Bubba Chandler, and some other names that are all part of this next class of – Pirates starters. So can you give us a little bit of a scouting report on what these guys are all about? Because I, you know, I think the Pirates get overlooked nationally in general. They've had tough times over the last several years. Is this the next great rotation in Pittsburgh? Yeah, man, it's exciting. Uh, you got, you got Solomedo. I, I was with him for one start last year in double A 
and uh, he's a little psychopath. He gave up a first <laughs> inning, like, RBI double, and he comes in after in the dugout. He goes, lucky run, lucky run. Like, Let's go, pounding his head and stuff. I'm like, dude, this guy needs to relax. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> he's a little psychopath. And Bubba takes his stuff serious. Uh, he's, a, he's a really good competitor. I like the way he pitches. And then uh, Skeens is just Skeens, man. He's, he's on a different planet every time he pitches. So you don't punch yourself? Who was the guy? Ken Giles, right? Isn't he the one who – yeah, gave himself a slug jealous. after he gave up the run. So after you give up a run, you don't come in and start. I I, I give myself some choice words. Okay. Yeah. Are you a thrower or a snapper? No. You're not like a guy that comes in and throws Gatorade coolers and nah. throws your glove. No, I'm not. I'm not strong enough for that. You just sit down. Alley <laughs> cool, bro. He, no, he sits down. He puts his hat down. He's got the perfect hair, and he's like, oh, okay, pour a little water on the hair. Okay, we'll get him next inning. No, 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 no. no. A lot, a lot of cuss words going through my head. <laughs> yeah, dude, Sola Meadows six five two twenty, and I know Skeens is huge too. I think he's six six two thirty five. But I like that about Sola Meadow. I, that that's what I was looking for. So, what is the reaction when he does that? Like, are are the guys fired up about it because it's different? Like everyone else sucks. I gave up one run. They're lucky. <laughs> I mean, there's some guys who take it, but I mean, for my preference, I'm like, what the hell is this guy doing? Like, <laughs> gave up one run. You got five, six more innings to go. Just go shut out baseball. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Uh, Sean Sullivan. I was going to say, if you room with Skeens, dude, you know, you might get a free room and board. And then, you know, there might be a guest appearance by his girlfriend who's kind of famous, too. I mean, yeah. Yeah, my uh, my girlfriend or my fiance is really excited about that. She does or she used to do gymnastics as well, so oh. she's she's excited about meeting her. Oh, double date, spirit hands, so yeah. exciting. Double date, is maybe possibly up? in the future. Pro- not lined okay. up, but maybe in the future. Do you have a cool story I mean, like Jack? Be up soon. No, I want to know if you had a cool story like uh, Jack had about getting engaged. Yeah, we told her it was this off season, December. Um, we planned it out for a couple months. I knew I, I had the ring for about two months. And uh, we told her when we were coming back home for Christmas that uh, we we're going to do family pictures on the beach. So she had no idea the whole day. She she went out to go buy a new dress. Um, and she's getting ready and she comes over and looks at me. She goes, why couldn't we, why couldn't you propose today? Like today would be the perfect day. We have a professional photographer and all this stuff. I'm just sitting there in the back of my head like, well, little do you know. And her first word was no. She yes, said, she like said no way. But yeah, that's the first thing I heard. <laughs> I was she uh, she had me sitting there on my knee for a minute. She was just like hugging me. She didn't know what to do. And uh, I go, Riley, I'm cramping. Like I got to get up. Are you gonna put the ring on or not? She did. She did. The and she did. You always be able to tell her. First word was no. Yep. Yep. I you always got no that one. You said no to me. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's good. If you ever want to yeah. make fun of me, hey, first word was no. Just saying, I'll never, yep. I'll never forget. <laughs> uh, well, congrats. What, what a freaking uh, last few months for you, man. Congratulations on making the team. We can't wait to see you pitch in Miami and throughout the whole season. Welcome to the Pittsburgh Pirates, Jared. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was great talking to you. Jared Jones joining us on FT Live. We'll be back out to Pittsburgh soon with more conversations with the Pirates. There he is. Kratz is back. All right, we're going to jump right to that's what he said because we have a lot to get to. So we're going to start with J.D. Martinez. So he signs last week. We went over it. It's one year. It's $12 million. It's tons of deferrals too. Did you see how the deferrals work? Seven Is it seven years of $1.5 million? Is that what it is? But starting in like 2030-something? All right, ready for it? So this year, he gets $2 million. And instantly gets a two and a half million dollar signing bonus. Then seven and a half million dollars deferred, payable in one and a half million dollar installments every January 15th, starting in 2034, running through 2038. And obviously, he lives in Florida, so no state tax during the time that he'll get paid for those deferrals. Here. Here's my question. Before you even get to any of your thing, because I wrote this down last week and I wanted to ask Ken Rosenthal, the contract wizard, the man who knows all the ins and outs of all this stuff. 
what, what, what's the narrative that we heard, especially from the Rangers, the whole year and teams the whole year? And I know it's not necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily happening with the Mets, but what's the narrative we heard all year? We're broke. TV money broke. So how are we still giving out deferred money if in the future they're not going to have this money? Or wait, do they have the money? And I know it's the Mets. I'm just saying, how, how are we giving out all this deferred money to players and yet we want to cry broke throughout the whole league? Well, because you don't have to pay deferred money now. You pay deferred money later. Also, it brings down the present day value of a contract. And for the Mets purposes, this is the most important part because the Mets are not broke. and They have never made it seem that way since the new ownership group has taken over. They have a luxury tax problem. You can be rich as can be, but the league is set up so that if you keep soaring past other payrolls, they will come down hard on you. And it's draft picks and it's tons of tax money that you have to give to teams that don't spend. So there is a bit of a reset going on for the Mets right now. That's what's happening. I mean, they still have Scherzer and Verlander on the books. They have, what is it, 60, is it $69 million in dead money? You saw that, right? Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's real. The Mets have to do some resetting. Their payroll is well into the 300s this year, and they would like to be aggressive going forward. They have found a way, and I'm talking about the CBA, to hold down the big spenders. That is a big part of the mix here, you know? Every Right now, it's true. I know we, we've talked about it a lot on our show. Owners are looking at every player once they get past that number and saying, I got to pay double on this dude. If you're, if you're someone like Steve Cohen with the Mets, everyone I sign, I got to pay double on them, on their present day value, right? If I sign a player for 10, he's 22 or, you know, because it's 110%. That hurts, you know? I, I don't disagree with you. But I just, I just want people to know that when you hear deferreds like this, that when teams say, you know, they call broke, if you, it's not broke like what if – you, if you see somebody, if your neighbor's like, I'm broke, I can't make my – you know, I can't pay you for mowing my yard all summer. I'll pay you 10 years from now. You'd be like, yeah, right, bro. If you're really broke, you ain't going to have money in 10 years. It's the same with the teams. Like we can't, we can't be, we can't be deked by the, by the, oh, we're broke RSNs. And then we're like millions in deferred money over here. Well, that's fine. At some point we'll have money. Yeah. When they're, when their franchise doubles and triples in value by, what did you say? 30, 2034, 2034, the Mets yeah. might be worth, might be worth $7 billion if they're worth three and a half billion now. All right, that's the point. Mike in the chat pointing out 90 to 100 mil comes off the books next year for the Mets. We're bringing AJ here too. And for the first part of that's what he said, the quote that you're talking about, Martinez said it almost feels like there's more teams out there not trying to win than teams that are trying to win. I think my point here, AJ, was that the luxury tax penalties are so severe that the Mets are hamstrung. And this creative deal enables them to get punished less on the short term. True. And uh, listen, deferred money, I know what Kratz said, isn't always the worst thing for a player because sometimes you need that money, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now. I mean, it's nice when you get a free check coming into you that you weren't expecting. I mean, I wish sometimes I'm like, man, I wish I would have deferred some money because then you could. But, you know, up front is nice, too, because you have it and it's making money for you. And I get that it, you know, it's it's considered value less. But uh, it, it, listen, whatever it helps. But this this thing that the CBA that we've negotiated, the players negotiated, you know, was acting like a salary cap, and that's exactly what players didn't want to happen. I mean, there's really only one team that blows over, and it's the Dodgers every year, and and they're fine with it because they have unlimited resources. But even Stevie Cohen is like, man, I don't want to spend this much. So it, it's kind of a – it's a weird situation. I also think that's what's led to some of the players now getting a little bit angry. We've, heard, we've talked about the Tony Clark stuff a little bit, but, like, they're like, man, was this the best CBA we could have gotten? And – some people right now, I think, are questioning that. But, yeah, this is definitely acting like a salary cap, and, and the players have always been against that. And we'll jump to that in just a sec. So let's close the book on J.D., who will back clean up for this team, right, and go behind. He helps the lineup. 
He, he definitely he helps, helps the lineup. lineup. A ton. Oh my gosh. A lot of support here for Pete Alonzo. He's going to need some time though. So he is going to take an optional assignment. That means you need at least 10 days in the, in the minors, meaning the earliest that he can be in the Mets major league lineup is April 7th. Mark Vientos was option. So that also helps tell the story. If Vientos just tore through spring training, it might've been a different conversation, but you know, he was not good. They didn't feel sold there. And I thought this part was interesting. Kratz, the second portion of that's what he said for J.D. Martinez on not signing with the Giants reportedly a year 15 mil so it would have been more money and it's ballpark conditions and I thought he put it really well he goes if I go there and I hit 260 with 20 homers people are going to say I'm old and I'm washed up and I'm kind of done and I'll find myself out of the game I want to give myself the best opportunity I thought that was a great answer I mean he's coming off a big year with the Dodgers and that park can absolutely, you know, swallow up, you know, your your pop, right? If you're a hitter like JD Martinez, and it's, go ahead. I mean, his pop. no, especially yeah. his pop because he he hammers balls to right center, and it is so difficult to put the ball out there as a right hander. Lefties lefties can hit that, you know, snapped left handed line drive through that wind. Bonds just made that park, you know, ridiculous for everybody to like because what he did was out of control. But that is so – that's so honest. Can I come on? And good. Hi. So like honest and really, really up front, knowing that he's not going to have quite the numbers. He's played there. He's played there in the division for years. Hey, Jay, are you recruiting? You're going to not talk to him. Say it again. We muted you for a sec. What'd you say? You, you know, guys know who Henry Davis is. I've heard of him. Did you want to come on? Well, he's in full gear. He's, I mean, he's in full gear, meaning full catching gear, getting ready for the game. He had the whole thing. His earpiece was popping out of his ear. I mean, he's like, he's. I'm like, hey, nice to meet you. Love to have you on. He's like, we'll do it after the season starts. I'm like, let's rock. Done. Done. So sold. He's You're excited. To watch. I didn't realize how big. He's way bigger than he was last year. Oh, really? Yeah, like he's – he looks – he's not as big as Rowdy, but Rowdy's big in a different way. <laughs> he had a, Maybe he had to cut weight to, you know, play the outfield all year. Yeah. No, he looked good. He's strong. Good hand – good firm catcher's hand. Ah, shape. love that. Love that. Thick hands. All right, second part of that's what he said. Ready for it? The ongoing saga within the Players Union features so many, you know, released statements – and I mean, for me, the way I was reading it publicly, you have someone that helped get the minor leaguers unionized in Harry Marino. It sounds like there were players that were trying to get number two in command, Bruce Meyer, out of there. And it led to a lot of, let's say, open discussions. And it sounds like it's settled for the most part now. And I mean, from the statement that, that I got on the, Tony Clark's side, it's it's settled and it has to do with the current group in place. So he said, for decades, the bedrock of the MLBPA has been an engaged membership that does not bend to outside agendas. If therefore, uh, it therefore comes as no surprise that a coordinated and covert effort to challenge this foundation has troubled players at all levels of professional baseball. These concerns are being discussed where they should be in clubhouses around the league. In due time, they be they will be resolved consistent with the traditions of this great organization. And there's one other part here that you don't see if you're watching the show on YouTube right now that's listed, but it was a statement about Harry Marino, who you know, has basically become a rival here, right? Because he's trying to upend what's going on with Tony and Bruce's situation. And well, I'll be able to pull up the statement here real quick. He said, quote, this is from Tony, who released a statement that was unanimously authorized by the subcommittee members, which is eight other players that are heavily involved within the union, including players like Jack Flaherty, um, oh, Marcus Semyon, Francisco Lindor, Lance McCullers, Lucas Giolito, Austin Slater, Brent Suter, and Ian Happ. Here's the quote. We still have issues to discuss, but one thing clear among the MLB executive subcommittee members is that this is no longer a Harry Marino discussion in any respect. Because Marino was trying to talk even a few days ago about, you know, maybe working with Tony. And I, I would say they're pretty pissed off and 
uh, that relationship in my mind is probably over. Those two are not going to work together. And he wasn't working with the PA. Now you guys go because you're the players. You guys have seen what's what they, going what's, on here. Scott, what's the saying? You take a shot at the king, you better not miss. <laughs> right? Marino took a shot. He tried to get the, the the minor league guys to do it, and they missed. And now, guess what, Harry? You had your shot. You can try to make it, but it ain't happening now, pal, because now you pissed off players. And, and the and the report, oh, I find it interesting, too. I also saw some reports where the, you know, he's trying to say that players are bullying other players into – like I, 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 as a former player, like we were always solid as far as uh, the union stuff came. Like there was discussions about it, but it was solid. Like we are behind each and every player, and we stand for the players. So I, it's almost like Marino knew he missed the king, and he and he lost his opportunity. So now he's trying to spin it into into a different thing for the union, and that's just not going to work. The players will come together and be like, "Yo, bro, nice try, go kick rocks." I'd like to see what, what his – I'd like to hear his side of it more too. I want to hear what his – like was he trying to oust, you know, guys that were on the executive committee too? Was he trying to like band together the minor league guys and the up and down guys? Because I feel like they are, and I was one of those, an underrepresented group of the, of the Players Association. But it is a group. You are part of an elite group of people, whether you're in the minor leagues or the big leagues. And if somebody's trying to come in and like, hey, why don't you go and say say this about these people? Like if it's under if it's undermining, you don't want that guy anyway. Anybody tries to undermine somebody else by using you, steer clear because they'll undermine you at some point too. So if that's what happened, I, I'm I want to hear what what Harry said, but we'll see. I just, well, Kratz, he, Kratz, here's, yeah. Hold on. I, I, here's my thing, Kratz. It's no offense. And listen, the minor leaguers are very important, and I get they feed the major leagues, but it is the Major League Baseball Players Association, and they fight for major league rights. And I know they've brought in the minor leaguers as part of it, but I feel like they, it's almost like, yes, they are a part of it, but they should be a smaller part of it because, again, it's the Major League Baseball's Players Association, and the Major League Baseball Union and the players and the teams of Major League Baseball are the ones that are funding the minor league. So the fact, and I and we've discussed this on the show, and I am not disrespecting minor leaguers at all, but you know, for big leaguers to have 38 votes, minor leaguers to have 34 votes, that seems like a lot to me because that seems like it should be a higher number for big leaguers and a lower number for minor leaguers because, again, it's the Major League Baseball Players Association. And I understand minor leaguers – need rights and they deserve rights because listen i struggled through the minor leagues just like everybody else making 800 bucks a month before taxes and they took 400 out a month for living so i was making 400 bucks a month before tax i was getting a check every two weeks for like 100 bucks so listen i i get it and their conditions have vastly improved since i was there but there's also there should be no way that this could happen. yeah no you have to and i think and i think it's i mean apparently the music agrees <laughs> That was that was the that was the music saying you you dropped the mic on that one. No, I I, I completely agree with you, but I, I think the voting is fine, thirty eight to thirty four. Like yeah, to but me, all it takes is three. It takes three guys to switch sides, and it changes, right? I I, guys. Hear, I I hear what you're saying, but to me, if you're having sides in voting, I think it's you're 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 missing the boat. Big league guys. It just, it just happened, though. That's the problem. Big league guys need to need to teach minor league guys. Minor league guys need to listen to the big league guys. And now that they're together, if they can push in the same direction, it will raise the it will raise the game. It will raise things for players. It will raise you know benefits for players. And it can't be just something that is like two sides if it's two sides then they have to work work that out and maybe maybe that's how maybe that's how harry saw his chance to to move on up in in the organization but that's that i hope that wasn't you know his ultimate goal i i did speak to some people on the minor league side that that tried to say it's, it's not coming from them right yeah. so there were a lot of you know quote and this is in stories like in the athletic rank and file players that were part of that group that was trying to, you know, start the mutiny coup, whatever you want to call it, right? So there's major league players 
involved in this situation as well. Um, but it looks like a lot of it has been settled now. Um, so I, I thought it was very interesting what played out over the last several days. The question I had for you guys to wrap this up, AJ, plays off what you just said. I love that the minor leaguers have a union now to stand up for them to get better conditions, better pay, the whole deal. That was well, 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 well overdue. They were getting treated like shit and not like full-time employees, and we know that they could not pick up another job in the meantime. It was crazy. But should they be two kind of separate worlds? Like, should they operate completely separately? Because right now they are together, and you know, 38 votes no. for the majors, 34 for the minors. They should all be together? I, I think they should be together, and I think what Kraut said okay. is important. Major leaguers should be around minor leaguers to help teach them. But I think that that's what it should be because there are way more minor league players that don't make the big leagues than there are major leaguers, right? So I, I think that that is where the biggest uh, miss is right now is that, you know, again, the, the, the minor leaguers are very important because they feed the major leagues. But at the same time, the major leaguers are where all the money is made. There, nobody's making money in the minor leagues player-wise. I mean, yeah, you're making some money. But they need to be taught. So should they be together? Yes. But I think it, it shouldn't be as close as it is. We're 30, 38, 34. I mean, you switch two guys, it's 36, 36. You switch another guy, the minor leaguers have a majority, 37, 35. And that's just – that shouldn't be that close to where it could happen that quickly. And they make a decision for a guy – you know, you have a guy in A-ball making a decision for Mike Trout who's been in the big leagues for 10-plus years. And they're like, oh, well – how, that guy doesn't know Tony Clark. He doesn't know Bruce Meyer. He just hears stuff from Harry Marino. And that's why it's like, wait a minute. They should be associated, but it's got to be a different gap to where it doesn't happen. In case in case there's dissension. No, I, I hear what you're exactly. saying. I hear, exactly. I hear what you're saying. And, and what Scotty said about rank and file, guys, that has been for years. My one gripe with the union is the lack of representation from the – middle class of players. And I think Harry saw that and maybe he latched on to those guys trying to get them what he saw was a way, a way in. And the biggest thing, you can't have two factions in one group, but I think they should be together because the minor leaguers, as you've seen for years, have zero power without the umbrella of the big, the MLBPA. And I think it is, great by the PA to extend out to the minor leaguers and the minor leaguers need to learn. And the sooner you have more young guys coming up to the big leagues that have learned what's going on with the PA in the minor leagues, because before you were never allowed to be any part of it. It was very restrictive to just big league guys. Now they're going to learn and they're going to get to the big leagues and they're going to be stronger as a group. Yeah, and I want whoever the league hates the most on my side. You know, like there, there were multiple reports in some of these stories that the league doesn't like working with Bruce Meyer. You know, like the other side, I'd be like, well, that's my hero. I, I'm not going to act like I know everything going on behind the scenes, but some people that are bothered about that, the last CBA deal was world better than the one before, was it not? It was. Right. Bruce so wasn't did there. That? Tony. I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't know exactly everything going on, but the fact that that's the guy that they would target—that's the guy that came in, who's worked with every union, who the league was finally like, "Oh shit!" That's exactly what you want if you're in a fight. You know, Tony came. That's what bargaining's Tony, about? Tony knew it. Tony knew it, and he went out and got Bruce soon after the last CBA. And to me, I think that was his best move. In since he has been the um, since he has been the head of the PA, bringing in Bruce Meyer, and we spent the five years up until the most recent CBA, that was the end of my career, building arguments, building continuity as a PA, as a players association, and it was around what Bruce can do and the negotiations that he can bring to the table. And to me, I think you saw a big swing a little bit back in the player's favor from all that was lost from this previous CBA. Yeah, good call. Like they're right, so playing, they playing, they playing black yeah. and yellow, black and yellow, black and I yellow. I heard that. Were they just playing yeah, we, black we, and yellow? We muted you so we don't, get, uh, we don't get flagged for commercial use or something like that. But here, you're back. Let's <laughs> do money moves, okay? Because we're running low on time here. So let's get to Ezekiel Tobar. 
signing an extension with the Rockies, seven years, $63.5 million plus a club option that could take him up to $84 million. What do you think about the Rockies sneaking in with an extension? They do this. For as much as we talk about them, AJ, being irrelevant in the offseason, they do take care of their own if they like them. And I think a lot of that has to do with the Monport family, the ownership group, acting like a mom and pop shop where they're like, oh, I like this guy. Let's keep him here for a decade. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, I, I would have liked to have seen more of from this guy, this player, Tovar, before they signed him to this deal. Uh, it's great for him because he got guaranteed 16 plus million, can go up to like 80 million or something, 70 million. Um, but you know, he didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't that effective as a player last year. So for him, they're like, hey, we'll offer you this. He was probably like, oh hell yeah, I'll take that, right? <laughs> um, because I mean, look at his numbers last year; they weren't very good. I mean, he had like a couple weeks stretch where he was good, but he came up, struggled, I think, had a hot stretch. And then the, the last like two months, he was he was not very good. So, um, I, I mean, I get it from the Rockies standpoint. They're going off the prospect capital. But at the same time, you, you'd like to see some results before you sign to a guy this long term of a deal. Defense. If this is what if this is what defense is costing, 63 and a half, because he was he was very valuable on the defensive side. Hitting wise. You know, he's only he's only 21, 22 years old. So you sit there and you go, okay, maybe maybe they see some potential in his 16 homers. Offensively, you're always going to get – offensively, you're always going to get hated on in Colorado. People aren't even going to look into your road stats. They're just going to be like, oh, Colorado, whatever, 16 homers. It's not really anything. If he can play shortstop at a big league level, to me, this is what's showing a defensive shortstop – is going to cost you 63 and a half for seven years. Man, I thought it was a great deal for the player. You know, most of the time I'm like, hey, it's a great deal for the team. It's a great deal for the player. I, I agree with you guys. That there is a chance that he does not hit enough in the bigs. He's young. You're right. I mean, he's, he's deep into 22. He's 23 soon. But OPS plus last year was 76. 100 at league average. He was an elite, elite glove. He's already one of the top defenders in all of the sport. That's why you get a two and a half war out of him. But the peripheral numbers were not great either. You do not get much exit velocity. There was a ton of chase. So it is a massive question mark. He could end up being an average hitter, and then he's a really good player because he's an elite, elite glove, and he's an average hitter. But there's a chance that the bat doesn't come along. So what if, what great deal to take. What if I give you two elite defenders – and their last name is the exact same, and you look at what they did when they first made it to the big leagues. J.P. Crawford, Brandon Crawford. How they hit when they first make it to the big leagues at that age. Not well. It's not great. It's not great. Okay. Well, then wait. Why don't you wait? Why, why yeah. sign him up? Why not wait? Why not and that wait? would be, and that would be my... And that would be my argument is this is what – when Scott Kingery got his deal without ever even playing in AAA barely, to me that showed baseball what 24 or $26 million is really worth to a team. They're like, ah, we, we, can try to, we can try to go get somebody for this money. When you put $60, $68 million out there for a defensive shortstop, it shows you that a team is willing to risk that. And it, so, to me, who's more excited about this contract? Ezekiel Tovar or Jackson Holiday? Why Jackson Holiday? Because he just found a new floor for any extension if the team wants to send him down to AAA and be like, hey, we want to extend you before you even get called up. Who knows? What if that's what happened in the minor league or what if that's what happened in spring training with Jackson? Hey, we'll give you eighty million. We'll give you eighty-two million, exactly what Churio just got. And he's like, "Nah." He's like, "All right, well, go marinate in AAA for a little bit." Yeah, I mean, Jackson Holiday is on another planet compared to Tovar. On another I'm just saying. planet. Yeah, I'm just I mean, saying. Yeah, the the Rockies went for it early. I'm with you here, AJ. They went for it early on this one. And the problem I have is that this is a team that does not get aggressive in the free agent market. So if you're going to allocate resources like this, they need to hit better than most on these players. Agreed. You know, because they don't spend, and they don't spend, they exactly. got to hit, they cannot miss. 
Yeah, they can't I, miss. I just I continue to look at the Rockies and think they're one of the only teams in my mind that are really behind. You know, uh, that was a great. But they're run differently. Right there. They're run differently. Um. Yeah, they yeah, they are run, they're, run they're very run, different. Run. Is it fair to say mom and pop shop? They're owned by a family, are they not? I mean, listen, you can have, you know, certain people run by by mom and pop, the DeWitts, you know, Stevie Cohen. I mean, there's 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 owners that own it as a family, but Brian Zorf, right? He, but there's also a different way to go about it. So um, it's just one of those things where they're they're the Rockies. And they're like, hey, we get twenty five thousand a game. What you know what? And we we had Arenado, we had Tulowitzki, we had Helton. We didn't win a World Series, so let's try it a different way. We'll just constantly rebuild. But people in Denver like going to the games, and they'll drink their Blue Moon, and they'll watch Dinger the Triceratops, and we'll be okay. Because guess what? Twenty thousand plus are coming to every game. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And if he's um, an elite then... shortstop, if he's an elite shortstop, two point two, I think, defensive WAR this year, this past year for him. If he's an elite shortstop, there's cases of elite defenders becoming much better with the bat when they are 20 to 22 years old breaking into the big leagues. AJ knows what it's like to be 20 and 22 in the big leagues. That's tough. It's tough. It, it, yeah, it was. It, it is tough. It, it's tough for anybody. I mean, that's why when you see a Bryce Harper, you see a Juan Soto at 19 years old. I mean, you see a Jackson Holiday possibly, <laughs> at, what is he, 20, 19 or 20? having a chance to make the big league team. I mean, that, that's a big deal. And, and that's why I think of Wyatt Langford fits better as a, making the team out of spring training. But listen, that's why also teams don't break camps with 19, 20 year olds. A lot of times you notice they come up in the middle of the year because there's already other things happening besides just throwing them into the opening day lineup. So uh, listen, happy for Tovar. If the Rockies are happy, then listen, I'm happy for the Rockies fans, but I think they could have waited and there's other ways they could have maybe allocated some of these resources, but I'm not the owner, and it's his money. He can do whatever the hell he wants. Yep. And then one more on money moves. Miles Straw was waived. No team's going to claim him because he still has $19 million left. And actually, here's a case of somebody who plays elite defense at a premium position in center field, but the bat has not come along. And so he is going to spend time in the minor leagues with Cleveland. It's actually kind of like the Rusne Castillo situation because no other team's going to pick up your contract. So if the team has to foot the bill then he's in the minor leagues. Now, the question I had, I didn't see an answer from anyone yet, was you, know, you don't have to accept that minor league assignment if you have, what is it, five years of service time? He's two months short, so they get to send him down. Once, So does that mean that he will just stay two months short and they can keep him down there for a long time because they didn't hit the threshold? So he can stay down there all year? Yep. Oh, wow. Yep. Okay. So he might be in the minor leagues for a while. They might be kind of... What? Trying to wait it out with him? I mean, but didn't Cleveland claim they don't have any money? This was a miss, right? $19 million for Miles Straw. Who hit, like, what, he hit zero homers? Like, at one time, he was, like, the longest-going guy without hitting a home run. I mean, elite defense, yeah, that's great. whoop de doo But eventually, you're going to have to hit to play a position like center field a little bit, right? So this is a miss by Cleveland for me. This is a miss by the Guardians organization signing him to this deal, and then now they have to send him a triple-A? You're going to pay him $19 million in AAA? Damn, Crouch, you sign up for that. I would sign up for that today. I'd sign it in blood. Yes. Yeah. I, that's, it's tough for Miles. My thing that sucks is did he know this before? Because now he went all spring training, and he had like an 855 OPS in spring training. You know, insert spring training doesn't matter because – he didn't make the team. They've they've moved on. If you go two seasons and you have one home run in the big leagues, and then you hit, you know, three fifteen, whatever he hit in the minor league or in spring training, and you don't make the team, they're moving on. And that's that's tough for him. Yep. They probably knew. That was probably they, a winter they, it, combo. It sounds like they knew going into the camp. It didn't matter what he did. And they were hoping. Yeah. I guarantee you they were hoping they could make a trade or find somebody. Maybe if they could eat half the money and find someone to take them, they probably would have. But nobody, nobody. again, what would you say, one homer in two years? That just doesn't play anymore. It didn't play when you played. I mean, it did. There yeah. was, you know, you could get away with it. Even Juan Pierre had five power swings a year. Like, 
but he's not here, I don't know. Womp here went along. Went, I played with Womp here a couple years. He might have hit one homer. But it was a he's, different era, and in, in, in Womp here wasn't making $19 million either. I mean, let's be serious here. I mean, listen, Miles Straw is still getting that money no matter where he plays. So, yeah. God bless Columbus him. is nice. Columbus is yeah, nice. It's 19 left, too, to clarify. It's not for this year. He signed a five-year, $25 million extension that kept ticking up, but he's got multiple years left and 19 in guaranteed money. This is a player who, in 2021, had a strong year. He was above average offense. The glove's always been elite, like we mentioned. He was 262. Wait, hold on. 271, 349. Hey, nice to meet you. you want to come on? On base. See how the recruiting goes for AJ. Uh, we just muted him. Here, I'll finish the numbers for him. Then in, in 2022 and 2023, Kratz, I mean, the batting average was low 200s. I mean, he's barely getting on 30% of the time on base, so then you can't really utilize the speed. So, yeah, it's definitely been tough for him. That's um, tough. I've been yeah. There. Yeah. It sounds like we'll get Brent Honeywell coming up in just a Love few this. minutes. Yeah. This dude, this dude before injury. Did you come across Brent? absolute firecracker just playing against him I, i'm so excited he was the one that he was throwing the uh the screwball if you remember he came up with the rays and i loved his when we played against him in 2017 we faced him twice once in columbus once in durham and his demeanor on the mound his fire was pure just like locked into what he wanted to do Anything else got in the way? He was out. I, I was, I was all on board with this guy playing against him. I'm like, yes, I love that demeanor. Stuff wise, everybody has stuff. To me, the separator is the demeanor. So I can't wait to talk to him. I've never talked to him. Yeah, it's been it's been a long road for him, and it's cool to see him. You know, obviously pop up you know, after some some elbow issues. So let's talk to him right now. We're going to go back to Pirates camp. AJ sitting next to Brent Honeywell. Brent, great to have you on, man. How's camp and how's this life journey been for you through the major leagues? We haven't talked to you in a minute. Uh, dude, camp, camp's gone probably about as good as I can imagine it going. I came in pretty tuned up this year. It was the first time in a, in a while where I was able to work in the offseason and not have to focus on just throwing the ball. Uh, you know, kind of getting some – you know, kind of refining my arsenal a little bit, you know, expanding, expanding my portfolio, I guess is how they call it. <laughs> so you got a death ball now? Cause everyone's throwing a death ball. What is that? I don't know, but everyone's, it sounds cool. So I, I throw the gas, man. You throw the gas? I just throw the gas. But Crash just said you throw a screwball. I got that too, but I throw the gas. Oh, what's like gas now? Is... Gas now. Like 95 plus. That's oh, there. My bad. But, but Crash, he said he punched you out on three pitches. No screwball needed. No, I he think he need... was in camp with me in Tampa. In Tampa, yeah, yeah. You were you were hurt in Tampa, but we were weird. In... Wait, we... did Kratz not talk to you in camp? No, Kratz, he talked to me in camp. Oh, okay. Because he's no, no, no. no. I wasn't. In, I wasn't in spring training. I was in. I was on the big league team. I didn't. I didn't waste yeah, yeah. my time with spring training. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh... Oh, yeah. That's that's right. That's right. <laughs> no, Brent. I, I was just saying to Scotty. I was just saying to Scott before when you before you were putting your earpiece in. We played against you in – I was in Columbus in 2017. You're probably like oh, yeah. 20, 22. You had that Faria guy who threw the invisible fastball. We don't need to – we don't need to take – you don't need to take your hat off. That's just AJ. It's okay. It's okay Canada, though. Oh, well, then in that case – Yeah, but you're not in the ballpark, but okay. Oh, okay. But okay. anyway. Fine, then. <laughs> we, got into, we, got, we got into it a little bit with you. You, you were – you, I think you went two two straight outings, seven seven plus with like ten punchies, and dominating. And somebody on our team, Ronnie Rodriguez, said something. And I oh said guys, yeah! And I, I said to the that. guys, I said, "This is the type of mentality you need to have if you want to be a big league starting pitcher, because you get play you get to play one day a week." And you were like, "Screw you guys! I'm doing what I want to do." Do you still have that even through all of your injuries? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of carried me throughout uh, the sport, my my journey through the sport. I think the, you know, if you don't like, why do you play? I mean, I don't, I don't play to. Yeah, you know, I like making friends along the way, but I mean, you know, it as good as well as I do, they ain't, they ain't, uh, they ain't friends on the other side at that time. <laughs> 
I'm I'm trying to eat too, you know. <laughs> You're gonna eat in the bigs? Are you gonna eat in the bigs? What's the deal? What's your plan here? Uh, it didn't it didn't work out for me this camp. I guess. Okay. Uh, I can't really. I can't answer why. I mean, I go out there and throw the ball. This is the best camp I've had, like I said, since I've probably been in Tampa, honestly. I mean, I had a good one last year in, in San Diego, but I came straight from the Dominican Republic last year and <clears throat> threw, a, threw a ton of innings down there, threw some innings down in spring. And I, I don't know, maybe I was a little gassed at the year, but, you know, it is what it is. I was able to find out what my arm could handle again, and everybody else was able to see that too, I think is the biggest thing. What is it like coming into camp as a non-roster? A lot of times, you know, you're sitting next to a dude next to you that never was a non-roster. So people don't understand what that means. I lived a life of non-roster. You know, I've never done it. It was like I said, like you said, it was my first time. But, you know, I, I kind of knew. I didn't really have anything until the uh, that week leading up to camp. Was I nervous about it? No, not really. Uh, you know, I think I had one thing on my mind and that was making the team. I always told myself, even whenever I was in Tampa, you know, I didn't have the chance to make the team there because I was hurt throughout all my option years there. So I didn't really give them a chance to really make a move on me. And, uh, you know, I think I kind of like where I'm at right now, man. It's, it's pay to play. You know, that's kind of how I look at it. It's like, you're going to get what you pay for in a guy like me. I think is the biggest thing. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do anything we can to win, you know, no matter where I'm at, no matter what team I'm on, I'll stick one of these days. But I think, I think the biggest thing, and it was a, I turned, I turned a pretty good corner when I worked with my dad this past off season. It was the first time he was able to, to work me out a little bit. He's taught me everything I've known, uh, which, you know, it was a pretty big corner. I turned this year in the off season with him and a couple of the guys I worked with, you know, it's, it's fun. And I would I would do it all over again if I had to to get to where I'm at now. You want to go? You're going to Indianapolis, I'm assuming. Then uh, maybe I don't know. I don't know. That's why I said I don't know how this non roster. I, I was never. I don't know. I got this weird thing. I got this like upward mobility thing. So hopefully somebody can come in and grab. Oh, you, okay. You got you have like a clause where you can you can opt out and go to the big leagues if a team calls you and says yeah hey, something something like that. You know I hope it's out there. Like I said, man, I've I've thrown the ball probably. The best I've thrown the ball in a couple of years. You know? Your elbow and everything is good because you went through – I mean, you battled some, some shit. Yeah, I was – everything's good, man. I can wake up in the morning and wipe my ass. I guess that's good. That's, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> I, I lived four years where that was tough, you know. But, uh, no, it, it's been great, man. You know, the – I mean, I know a team that needs some pitching. You were already on them, though. White Sox. I'll pitch there. All right. You like the White Sox. I used to. <laughs> Too much. AJ, hey make a call. We got gets on what? In a day or two? Wednesday, Wednesday, I think he's coming on. I'll talk to him. I'll talk make him up. Make a call. 3 2 4 yeah. ERA, 8 and a third in spring, 10 punchies, whip under one. Sign me up. They need some good in. Dubs. It's been it's been great. It's been it's been great having these guys around here though. I mean, I walked in, you know, when you come in to a new a new team every year, it's like they don't you know, you don't really have any chemistry with guys unless you played with them before. But I found more, more of those guys than I have, like, you know, going in kind of, you know, under the radar kind of deal. I think, you know, these guys here, Oscar and, uh, you know, Mess and Radley, they've kind of let me do my own thing here. And like I said, I've, I've tweaked some things around and I've got, to, I've got back to where I know pitching again, and I think is the biggest thing. Take, take us back to what you just said about how you can't wipe your own ass. Four years, four years of your arm hurting, is that way on you? Or is that something that you're like, you're stronger because you know you came through it? Um, I think I'm stronger because I, I kept the same. I always knew it would work, dude. Like I always knew anything that I throw in there will work. My arm just has to work, and I trusted in the fact that I knew I knew myself. Um, you know, some of the training staff I had, you know, along the way, they were great. You know, the <clears throat> Tampa's training staff was 
Paul Harker and Joel Smith really took some they they really they took me in as I was one of their own, not just a player for them. And I think you know that kind of stuck with me. I stayed in contact with them. Uh, you know, I I wake up every morning knowing it would one day work, so I just kept pushing through it. And I had a guy on my team though that I watched go through something like this, turned into a really good friend of mine, and he kept going. And I made him keep going every now and then because he wanted to stop and hang him up, but. Johnny Venters, ever heard of him? I know Johnny Venters, yeah. yeah. Oh, man. But he, uh, I watched him push through some, some, some serious stuff, but, you know, that was a little bit different for me because I watched him growing up as a kid, being from Georgia and being a Braves fan growing up. I watched him as a kid, him, O'Flaherty, Kimbrell, and Billy Wagner when they God, were there. I, like, all, I've, I mean, you're making me real, feel really old, Brad, <laughs> because, uh, I mean, I played with O'Flaherty, I played with Kimbrell, I faced Wagner. Oh, man, thanks. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> I play with those guys on the bridge. <laughs> so it was, like I said, you know, I, to get to, to play in the big leagues, I think, I mean, dude, it's the coolest job in the world. I don't care what anybody says. There ain't an amount of money that people can make that's too much in this game, in my opinion, after what I've been through. Hell no, nah, dude. You got superheroes that play this game, man. You guys that I go out there and do it every day and continue to do it. You played for fucking forever, dude. It's Long like you're time. one of them. Long you know? time. Long Crazy time. Very, too. Very fortunate. But, you know, that's the other thing, too, is I'm, I'm grateful for people I've met along the way, good ones, bad ones. Um, but, you know, I've learned – I learned a lot more about the game sitting at home when I couldn't wipe my ass than, than I think playing. <laughs> and I think, you know, trying to, trans, trying to transfer what I learned off the field when I wasn't playing to on the field, I think there was a little bit of an adjustment period. The learning curve kind of left me a little bit because I just wasn't able to see the swings and what guys were doing and the league kind of outran me a little bit. But now I think I'm, I'm back in tune with, with where I'm at and what the league's kind of doing. And for the most part, I, I mean, not for the most part, I mean, I know I'm a big league arm and I know I can, I'm serviceable in any, in any role. Like well, sell that. yourself. Yeah. I love that. Hey, Brent, you're 28, not 38. You got a lot of time left, hey, man. We're rooting hey, for you. And one we'll of these days, it, right? I hope to sit down with this guy again when I'm 38 in the same fuck show. That'd be awesome. <laughs> That'd be all. Awesome. I hope I'm still up right now. You'll be in. Point. You'll be in. It's, as 10 years from now, up, hell. Yeah. I'll be looking hell like yeah. crats in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you Boy, still throw knuckleball? Oh, yeah. To the high school yeah, kids. Yeah, you got now. it? You still work on it? Yeah. You got to keep it. All right, good. You got to keep it just in case, dude. I mean, damn. You Just never know. Point. You never know. Well, Brent, <laughs> we're rooting for you, dude. We want to get you back once you're once you're up in the show again, right? You'll get that call real soon. Uh, hopefully, land with the squad in the next you know, few days. AJ's going to put in a good word with the White Sox. Say you're you're even better than ever, and uh, can't wait to talk to you when you're up again. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, fellas. Thank you, Brent. Good talking yep. to you, AJ. We'll get back to you in just one sec to finish up. Um, Kratz and me here as we get close to wrapping up. So we'll do slap hands in a moment. Um, I have to talk about, uh, unfortunately, you know, a passing in our sport, which we'll get to in a sec, and then we'll get you set up for the rest of the week, including a brand new show that debuts in a few hours from now. So let's slap hands. All right, so the game lost uh, an owner at the age of 94 years old who was running the Baltimore Orioles for a very long time. Um, thoughts with the Angelos family. Uh, it's the passing of, of Peter Angelos, who unfortunately was you know, incapacitated for a while. And we kind of discussed the Orioles ownership situation quite a bit this past year. But this is a guy who made a ton of money, won the team in a bankruptcy auction and ran the team for a very long time. There's our guy, Adam Jones. Talking about Peter, obviously, Jonesy knew him well. So, uh, again, thoughts with the fam. This was a guy who was a very interesting owner. This is why I love covering owners because they have so much personality. Obviously, there's some that I love and some that I criticize. But here was a guy who was kind of an instant hero there because he was spending money on the team. That changed over time. There was always, you know, something to cover. I mean, he had the toughest physicals in the game. If you were a free agent, you want to sign with Peter Angelos, he's like, you better have all your body parts in line. Otherwise, 
I'm calling foul. So I would say, I, and I think he talked about it later on in life, that there were probably some regrets with like a Pat Gillick and a Davey Johnson. You know, there were split ups there that maybe could have led to more success with Baltimore over time. And now the family moves on because the team is sold and that should be completed in the next, I think, week or two to the new ownership group. Which is a change, change in MLB and change, hopefully for the better of the city of Baltimore. Anytime you want to connect with a team as an owner, I mean, connect with a city as an owner, you come in and you try to figure out things that connect with the city. So for Adam Jones to say both of them had the love of Baltimore, both of them had the love of what, you know, Baltimore embodied, that's how you connect. And he did a great job early on in his ownership. And obviously there's things now that, that were kind of out of his control, kind of went to the rest of his family to run it. And so to me, I think his legacy will be forever. Make As soon as he bought the team, the connection, the, the immediate connection to the city of Baltimore and what they brought during that time, some, some really good teams. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, let's move to Kratz Hats. What do you got for us? I mean, when in Rome, right? When in Rome, little pirates, yeah. old spring training hat, nothing like, nothing like what they're wearing today. But your first, your first free agency, big. Let me see if there's a number in here. Oh yeah, number seventy-five. So this was after this is my second year of being in in big league camp with the Pirates. I played one year in spring training. I think I got a total of like. 14 at-bats in two seasons in big league camp with the Pirates. <laughs> so many at-bats. That's a D for me, AJ. I hate the sides on that thing. I've talked about it before. It's a solid D. Yeah, it's not good. It's not, it's not good. Not. G, yeah. <laughs> I don't like the sides. I don't like the last thing. I had some of them hats. The hats didn't fit for shit. Yeah, and they're, and they're short, too. Like, look at, like, oh, yeah. like, the whole show, I've been, like, pulling it down. Not like, like, look at AJ's foul territory hat. Like, it's like nice. It like fits down closer to the ears. You can wear it like, like you can't only wear it like this. Like you're like Ugh, pulling it down. Low profile, not it. Not it. Yeah. AJ, we're going to get a special guest on tomorrow. I know we just mentioned Chris Getz running the White Sox front office on Wednesday. Do we have a special guest tomorrow? Are you breaking Maybe? news to me? Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say anything. I'll talk to you off the show because I don't want to make any false promises, but maybe somebody really Clueless. young, young player, very young. Oh, that maybe, but I don't know. He's kind of ghosting me now, so I don't know. He's big. Oh, uh, okay. All right. We'll talk know. about it. I like confusing. Yeah, like, he was like, I'm Ron Burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris gets though. That'll be fun. We'll talk to the White Sox yeah. GM coming up in a day and a half. Um, and then lastly, the debut of Dodgers territory. We had Alana Rizzo and Ken Rosenthal expanding the Fair Territory show on Thursdays live. Alana is hosting Dodgers territory twice a week because there's just nothing to talk about with this team. Alana and Clint Pasillas, it's an all-star combination. They'll have exclusive player interviews. They'll have unfiltered takes, inside access. These two know the team as well as anyone. And conversations with other members of the Dodgers community, like the Dodgers Blue team, the Dodger Blue um, website contributors. So it's going to be great. The debut show is today at three o'clock Eastern time. It'll be every Monday and Thursday at three Eastern. I'll be in the chat for all these shows as much as possible saying what's up to everyone. So we're excited for that. Congratulations again to Alana and to Clint. And tomorrow we'll have Kenny Ballgame Jr. Rosenthal joining us and ask Kate, uh, MLB super influencer. Excited to have her on for a segment to help, uh, get acquainted with some rules that we need help on. So good stuff, AJ. You survived the tornado. Dude, listen, this is this is this is a day. This was a day to go down in the history books of uh, days. Your uh, the wind, the, but I give I give the interns credit, man. They busted their ass today. So uh, in late show up for the Pirates. So credit to the Pirates. We we were able to get on Rowdy, Shelton, Sawinski, obviously Brent Honeywell, um, but Jared know, Jones. Uh, Jared Jones, sorry. Uh, but yeah, just thank you to the Pirates. Thank you for their hospitality. It just sucks when it's the last day of camp and you're trying to sneak them in. 
No, it was great. At least we got to it. I got to I got to tell you, this was a big success. Thanks to all the teams and the players for uh, being a part of our spring training tour. That's the end of our spring training tour because the season's about to start. We did, I think, one or two camps last year. We did like double digits this year and hopefully we'll do them all next year. So hope you guys enjoyed us visiting the camps and weathering the storm whenever we were there to talk to as many players as possible. We'll see everyone tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern time. And then Wednesday, we're back to one o'clock East Coast time for the rest of the year. See you Tuesday.